This is a good side. Maybe we should like. All right, we're going. Signs. We'll do that in the video afterwards. Recording is going. All right. How's everyone doing? Good. 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 How many people are still working on the Red Hat Labs? Really? Raise your hands. Oh, I know. I know you. I see you guys. That's fine. You can keep doing that. Um, we are, no. uh, laptops are not required for this. Um, it will be, um, you can probably do some things in your laptop. That's really going to be a more interactive workshop. Um, I'll give you a little background on why that is. Um, so I apologize. Uh, in advance, if this is some of the stuff that you weren't expecting, I'll go through what, uh, what this will be and what this won't be, uh, so everyone's kind of aware beforehand, uh, so you don't sit here for two hours waiting for the labs or the, uh, anything like that. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm Information Security Officer in local government, uh, also a managing partner with a software development company called Code Red. Uh, essentially, I uh, also play a weapons instructor. Um, and uh, unicorns and all the things security. Uh, frequent talker, uh, go over to all the things. Um, you might have heard me speak before. Um, and does anyone know what that is in the corner? Richie. Rich. There you go, look at that. Um, all right, so this is going to be a little more interactive. Um, I'll go through um, some of the agenda here. I'm going to do a lecture and discussion. I really want the lecture and some of the things um, that I'm talking about to be uh, kind of a two-way thing. How this came to be a workshop, uh, I did submit just a one-hour talk here, and then they contacted me uh, about a month before the con and said, hey, can you do a workshop? So um, this is what I have put together. So I apologize uh, for you guys being my guinea pigs here. Um, uh, we were also supposed to have, uh, I was, I'm going to give uh, Benny a lot of crap for this, but uh, we were supposed to have a full instance of uh, the uh, automation orchestration as well as the centralized logging in this CTF uh, environment. Uh, we were going to actually get, be able to give access into that and actually be able to build out some of these uh, enrichment uh, 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 engines as well as a lot of automation. That's what we could do in the CTF environment. So as people were attacking the CTF environment, we would see events come in and we are going to have some kind of pre-built events go through and do some triage and kind of automate some alerting. Uh, and uh, see it, all the context and everything you can get, get from there. Obviously, some of the threat intelligence stuff wouldn't work because it's all internal um, IPs on the network and things like that. But we're going we're to try to set that up. Uh, so we don't have that. Uh, but we will talk about that. We'll talk about the concepts. We'll talk about the concepts of automating um, security operations, where to focus at, um, as well as go through tool time on a budget. Again, this is on a budget, so there are a lot of enterprise tools that can do these things. There are enterprise orchestration and automation uh, engines. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, out there. Um, and some of the tools that we'll talk about, there, there's probably six different uh, dozen tools um, uh, that, we will, that we'll be able to do what we're going to do. We have a few that I use, so we're going to be uh, going through some of those. But I'll mention other ones, and if anyone's had any other ones, we can talk about those as well. Um, uh, and then we'll have an exercise time, uh, kind of more of the workshop. Uh, it's going to be a modified tabletop. How many people have done a tabletop exercise? Cool, watch that. So this is going to be a, uh, a modified version of a 15-minute tabletop. 15-minute uh, tabletops, this is kind of the term I, 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 I have for them, are just very, very low-level um, or high-level tabletops. Uh, one scenario, you have a few injects, and you're just, cause this discussion base, and you just kind of fill out an after action report. Uh, this is a little modified to focus at learning what, what part of your incident response or security operations, or even IT operations, uh, can be focused on being automated uh, for time to remediation. Uh, so we'll go over that as well. So, as I said, uh, workshop. Uh, what it is and what it's not. Uh, it's not a hands-on workshop, sorry. Uh, uh, you guys uh, don't don't beat me up over that. Uh, we're not going to be building any automation infrastructure. We only have a few hours here. Uh, even the environment that we're going to do here, I mean, you have the build, build automation. Um, and I'm not talking about just having Ansible do things and having... Uh, you know, Shepherd Puppet. I mean, this is going to be security operations um, and incident response auto, auto, automation as well. Uh, so there's a lot of things that go uh, into that that are kind of, uh, uh, you can have, you know, 
10 different servers running, uh, or at least VMs running and stuff like that. So uh, we're not going to solve all your problems. You know, we don't, I don't have unicorns and keyboard elves working. Um, and uh, we're not the, you know, we're not going to talk about any cyber immunity, AI, Skynet systems. Uh, that's, uh, Huh? No Skynet? Mm -hmm. No Skynet. <laughs> that's, that's, if I had three more hours, we would cover Skynet. <coughs> A unicorn net, yeah. Um, what this is, uh, again, as I said, uh, it's an overview. Um, automation, how it fits into security operations, um, and kind of what you need for that. Uh, you have to have a pretty, I wouldn't say mature, but definitely foundational security environment. Uh, to start doing any, automate anything, because your automation is only be as good as uh, first of all, your skill set, your staff, as well as the data and the items and process that you have built in that, right? Just like any piece of software or uh, any even process, it's only going to be as good as what you put into it, right? Uh, so if you don't have those built, then you're not going to have good, a lot of good automation at all, right? Um, uh, and we're going to review some frameworks, tools, resources, technical frameworks um, uh, to build out automation on a budget. Uh, we'll go over those. Uh, I wish we'd go more into the tools. I do have a couple demo uh, instances that I have access to, um, but again, without setting up a full environment uh, and having um, full caseloads kind of loaded in there, um, we just don't have that. It won't give you the full full kind of uh, aspect, but we can definitely talk about it. So the goals, um, understanding the basic components uh, uh, and role of automation. Uh, there are things that you really want to focus on automation and things that you don't want to focus on automation at first. I mean, obviously the goal is automate as much as possible uh, in any type of IT environment, uh, but you definitely want to focus. Uh, if you don't have a lot of the foundational items in certain places of your security operations or IT operations, uh, then you might be able to automate something there, uh, maybe something that you know um, is accurate and has uh, the data that you need to do the automations and workflows that you have available. Um, again, identifying areas of automation, uh, even if you can't do some of this automation or you have the capabilities of it, uh, you can uh, definitely the tabletops are good, uh, especially the small tabletops uh, are, are very useful in just identifying areas of basically just improvement. Uh, it doesn't even have to be automation, so it could be process improvements, and that's really the goal of any tabletop exercise to identify gaps um, and, and have deliverables at the end. Um, a show uh, from the people that said that they have done tabletops before. Are those official, like one day, two day, full tabletops, or were those like half day tabletops? And just sh shout out full, full day, full day, full yeah. day. Yeah. So um, nice thing about uh, was what I've done with some of the fifteen. Actually, it's a whole group work group of people that have built the fifteen minute tabletops. You can take you know an IT team. Uh, and maybe even uh, some uh, upper management. You can just have like an hour, hour and a half meeting, and you can do a full tabletop. Uh, again, it's not going to be as intensive. You're not going to have multiple inject scenarios. You're not going to have all your policies and procedures out there to, you know, but you'll definitely go through a scenario and identify large gaps. So a lot of people that are building automation on a budget probably don't have the resources to do, um, you know, full day, multi day tabletops and stuff like that. Um, so that's good that a lot of people here have. I assume that some of those people are probably government employees, maybe, no? What, we'll get into that. I am going to have people basically introduce themselves. If you don't want to introduce yourself, what you do, because I need, I want to get a fit of the audience, uh, feel free not to. Um, uh, so yeah, right here, discussion time. Uh, so if you don't feel comfortable, I just want to get a, a, a kind of lay the land to the audience and stuff so we can kind of have, a again, two-way street here. Um, who has... Uh, been involved with security oper uh, automation or automating instant response and things like that. Okay, all right. Well, this is probably really boring for you guys. Sorry. Um, oh, what, so what level of maturity of that, if you None. mind me asking? Huh? Not the lowest. The lowest level of maturity. Four out of ten. Or are you are you enriching data for analysts to have better time remediation? Are you in full? Um, automation where there are actions being kicked off and a, a, a off of a certain type of data sets with no manual intervention. Uh, some of, yeah, some some systems are being automatically kicked off. So, kind of okay. When you say mature, are you talking about the five levels of maturity, or are you just about uh, no, I'm not talking about from like the maturity matrix or anything like that. Just just general maturity. 
uh, you know, we're not going to get too much into the, the frameworks or technical staff. And, um, right. Good discussion there. <laughs> <laughs> you guys awake? We had all the levels of security, but we were also an MSSP. Oh, yeah. Okay. How many vendors do we have in the room? Do we have any MSPs? There you go. Cool. Sim security MS? MSS. Working on it. Working on it. In progress. In progress. Okay. I won't steal any of my information. We all copyright. <laughs> Not really. So, okay. All right. Um, do we have how many government? Do we have local government, state government, federal government? You don't have to say what agency or anything. Okay. Do we have uh, healthcare sector in here? Okay. Do we have uh, what level? What what side of healthcare? If I might ask you. Insurance. Insurance. That's interesting. Um, uh, how about education? People. All right. Marshall University, represent? No? Great University? Marshall? There you go. There's one there. Um, all right. Um, let's see. Any other industry sector? I know I could go through all, all of them, but. Uh, Previously financial. Previously financial. Any other financial banks? Cool. Cool stuff. All right. Students. No students? All right. Okay. Professionals. Huh? Utilities. Utility, okay, well, pu uh, pu public utility or private utility? Public. Oh, okay, all right. All right. Um, is it, uh, I know you said federal, is there any state, local government in here? Okay, are you guys part of, uh, like, the MSI SAC? Are you familiar with that? Okay, all right, cool. Um, just, uh, I'm also co-chair on the disaster recovery business, or the business resiliency uh, work group. Uh, so a lot of these 15-minute tabletops are, uh, are covered inside of our monthly calls. They're also available if anyone wants. Uh, they are not, uh, uh, they are open source, essentially. Um, all the tabletops. So the tabletops we'll be doing today are kind of modified tabletops. I make them a little more technical. Uh, uh, the ones covered usually are more high level. All right. Chatty crowd. Okay, automation. Uh, does anyone anyone have a background on autom uh, automation? The uh, the theory of any computer scientists in the room? All right. Any uh, program theory classes? Any, any nothing? Do you guys take classes? <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Good. All right. So. Um, Anyone want to be able to guess what type of automation we'll be mostly talking about here? Turing? Hmm? The Turing machine? <coughs> Turing machine? Yeah, it's a big one. I wish. <laughs> that would be fun. That'd be... Anyone? Combinational logic? Yeah, we'll be focused on combinational logic. Um, uh, again, uh, basically taking something, if something does this, do this. Uh, there are a lot of machine learning algorithms that will do fuzzy logic and things like that. Again, it's combinational logic. Um, when you start getting into the uh, uh, larger uh, portion of automation, you're talking um, just something that the security industry, I think, is just getting into. Um, uh, maybe if you have some of the you know, IBM Watson stuff doing some type of, or dark trace or something like that. You're getting kind of in there, but you're still not at uh, uh, still a high level of, of, of automation. When I say that, I mean automational logic where um, a lot of stuff is still just using fuzzy machine learning. Uh, there's very uh, few things using uh, any type, anything uh, over that. Um, again, security automation uh, from the combination logic will be focusing on, again, and taking all of your foundational uh, 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 sections of security and, and uh, models within. So if you have uh, vulnerability management, uh, you have uh, your security operations of centralized logging, um, obviously you have your SIM and your alerts and you have your threat intelligence data. Uh, and just marrying all those together to be able to make essentially logical choices, automated logical choices on that to enrich the data and as well as the event data to be able to make better decisions quicker or completely automated decisions. Um, but again, those automated decisions are probably very, very simple. For instance, this comes in, block this IP address. 
Uh, that's great automation. As simple as that is, that is monumental to for a uh, security uh, department to get to. Um, again, I know that there might be the firewalls to do that automatically, but I'm talking about things that have gotten through, uh, right? I'm not talking about just geo blocking or uh, blocking because it's on a malware list or something like this. I'm talking about something that's gotten through and all of a sudden automatically blocking it or at least making it very easy uh, to block. Uh, so one of the, the largest ROIs, and we'll get into this uh, more and more detail, is say phishing emails, right? Phishing emails come in. Um, are they reported by our users? Um, you know, phishing emails are blocked. Probably don't really care to look at them uh, as, as more as the stuff that's gotten through. Uh, but how many how many people uh, have an organization where you can report a phishing email, not simply just forwarding to a mailbox, but an actual button that actually takes the, the headers, raw headers, and things like that, right? It's pretty basic now. Um, anyone else know? Who has a report to this button? I'm yeah. one company. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, so, again, there's ways to, to implement those things. Uh, there's a lot of open source utilities to do that. Uh, but, you know, getting those things, uh, once you get them in and you train your users to use that, you're getting all kinds of emails reported to you, and probably 80% of those are probably marketing emails that they have on the subscribe list. I mean, do you really need to go and look at those? But how do you know? Maybe it's a spoofed uh, subscribe, uh, you know, vendor or some type of notification, right? How do you know that? Uh, if you're all of a sudden getting hundreds of emails reported to you and you only have two SOC emails, right? How many people have more than five people on the security department? How many people are the only ones in their security department? I'm, I'm one of two. Two, okay, I'm one of two, all right. One of two, right? Yeah, so I mean, um, if you have, and I assume, how many people have over a thousand users in their organization? How about 5,000 users? Around. Okay. Um, so, again, when you start getting up to that and you start getting the, uh, um, I hope if you have more than 5,000 users, you have more than two people in your department, but you might not. Uh, but when you start getting, you know, say 0.5%, 1% of your user population daily, um, you know, reporting phishing emails, so you can get up to the hundreds pretty easily. Um, uh, what's the average you think a SOC analyst spends on a phishing email triage? We're not talking about something that's clear text or something like that, but just if there's a link and there's it goes 30 minutes. 30 minutes, right? Maybe, right? I mean, you have to switch over. It might take you five minutes to do it, but you're doing other things. Things are coming at you. It might be 30 minutes, maybe an hour on something that's a little wacky. Right, um, but I mean, if you get hundreds of those, are you going to look at each one? Right, I mean, huh? It depends who got them, right? Now, when they come in, do you know that that person is a high-level VIP or you know, or um, executive or has access to the class or sensitive data um, right away? Or you have to look that up in a directory, then you have to kind of look at the job title, maybe the job title is right after directory, and then you have to kind of. How's that? How's that work? If you, if it, or do you have a list? Just people you know are important. In a previous life, I was, there was certain guy, certain uh, employees that I didn't work on the upper management. I don't know. Something weird came in for them. You drop what you're doing. You figure it out. Okay. Does anybody have a, a, an actual classification of risk per employee? Do you want to kind of a little explain that or for the group? Yeah, so okay. uh, high-profile C-level executives fall into a certain category, mm -hmm. and um, basically any anything they touch or have access to gets a, graded on a scale of one to ten in our environment. And the higher the number, the more sensitive mm -hmm. it is. And, and where where is that? Is that stored in a classification system, mm -hmm. or is that <clears throat> an accurate director? Do you have? And then in a specific OU, and they're just always there. So, so um, yes. So partially Active Directory, and then we actually have um, a custom in-house database that mm -hmm. stores a bunch of the statistical data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So when you get into a lot of this stuff, and you're saying, "Hey, I need to like this data enrichment," this, and all of a sudden you start throwing up access databases, and you start 
you start um, kind of doing your in-house stuff. Again, if you want to pay for something, you know, you can pay for like a, uh, something like a, a Vronis solution or something or any type of other user behavioral analytics system, right? So you can start putting that metadata in, taking it from Active Directory, knowing what permissions they have access to, what folder structures they have access to, and things like that. Those, those cost a lot of money. Um, and it's really not, if you have skilled people, it's not that difficult, again, to get that type of information in there. So uh, that's kind of the, kind of going right into the, uh, the incident response and triage here is that, again, you're trying to limit, as you can see that, um, you have that, that dwell time, the containment time visits the deck. I'm not talking about full incident response kind of process, but it's just generally speaking there. Um, uh, you know, how long, you said maybe 30 minutes, right? Uh, you know, that's even before the, the dwell time is there, right? When users report, um, you know, an email, have they already clicked on it, they, they kind of click on it and then report it, right? Um, and then when you're talking about uh, regular uh, just events and, and things like that, uh, I mean, how well are your sims really tuned? How much data are they really getting? Um, you know, uh, are they getting a lot of data or are you just having thousands and thousands of alerts or no alerts or not even sure if it's really working and you're like, oh, maybe I, would I be able to detect if someone uh, all of a sudden got access to a sensitive security group and active directory that wasn't supposed to? I mean, would, would, you, would, would anyone be able to detect that in this room? Say an administrative assistant got access to a legitimate access to a a folder that required a sensitive security group as defined in Active Microsoft Active Directory. Would would that would that kick off an alert? How would you know if that was a ticket that actually that person is supposed to have? Discussion discussion time. Talk to me. Well, the previous life, I tell you something similar to that, where um, had auditing turned on for users' privileges um, for some reason, or change, if there was a change mm -hmm. to the object, uh, depending on the uh, type of change, mm -hmm. uh, my mechanical or husband was critical, high, my medium, mm -hmm. and low. Um, if it was in the critical or high, we'd get an instant uh, text mm -hmm. message and email about that. And how would you know it wasn't in a ticket? It wasn't legitimate? And so I'll have to investigate that. You had to investigate the ticketing system, right? That is correct. So, at least from a default privilege accounts and okay. account operators, those kind of things, yeah. those are all alerted immediately. Correct. Yeah. And I, yeah. Okay. But then, as we move through and identify critical, you know, critical data in a file share, those groups are also being identified and alerted. Okay. Um, you know, how do I how do I associate that to an access ticket? Well, the cybersecurity team actually runs access tickets. It's part of our ticket queue, but. Oh, okay. a larger, a larger organization. Right, so some, some, oh, please speak. <laughs> <laughs> we use a third party software that would track access for stuff like that, mm -hmm. but only in like, finance and HR. Right, okay. Yeah, so like some, some places might have like an IAM or IDM system that kind of has that functionality, or if your security operations is inside that ticket workflow, most likely you would. No, that's not a legitimate off the top here. Maybe it does enrich your um, and change your similarity, and then all of a sudden, you know, that person has legitimate access to this uh, this folder. Um, I mean, obviously, I hope if uh, a someone like an executive assistant or janitorial staff also got like account operators or print operator, I hope that every one would be alerted. But I mean, have you tested that? Right. Um, I'm not saying to go test that, but I mean, do you make sure there's an alert that would functionally you know, <clears throat> kick off, and who would that kick off to? Um, so, like, uh, so, so when, when you say alert, do, do you, so our access management team pretty much handles the scenario you mm -hmm. laid out in front of us. When that happens, though, we we do get alerts for incidents like that that, mm -hmm. are, that are questionable. But it's more of a manual process. Like, mm -hmm. there, there's, so that's yeah, that's fine. I'm not saying people won't have these things. I'm just yeah, trying to yeah, okay. so, yeah, we get discussion. Do. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, I hope I would hope so. You have some type of manual process. Right. I mean, every single thing is manual. That's fine. A lot of places operate like that. I'm not saying that the, um, not having automation. You guys are in the Stone Age, but it's really something to think about because a lot of people uh, don't really go through and see the workflows of how something gets. Um, actually reported to remediate it. Uh, for instance, in, in our environment, um, our security operations does not have the ability to remediate some things like that because 
we are not domain administrators. That's the engineering team, a specific team within that uh, that has that type of access. So we have to interoperate with those people. Um, uh, how many people, security department, are also the domain administrators or have that capability? All right? Okay, a few. Okay. Um, now, how many people that don't have those are your domain administrators essentially on call and working 24 uh, 7? That would respond to a, a security incident at night. I mean, uh, do they have an on call list? Yeah, but I mean, are, are they going to wake up if all of a sudden, you know, how long would it take for that person to? to wake up and, and do something, right? Um, so again, identify those gaps. If that's what you have, you have. But just again, identifying those gaps going through, where does automation make sense and where does it not make sense? Right. Good discussion. Anything else there? Anything anyone want to add? I, I, I know for at least our environment, we tend to automate things that um, we'll spend a lot of time automating a small piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. but still continue to do <clears throat> the heavy lifting manually. So it's as if there was no benefit to doing the small automation piece. Like, <laughs> we, we spent three hours to save 10 minutes. Okay. That's but that's 10 minutes over potentially an entire year, right? Uh, every correct. time. Right. Right. I mean, but it's just, it's, yeah. it, it seems like it, it's perpetually mm -hmm. thing after right. thing of that happening. Right. Right. So if you take something like this and identify that essentially, or that, that 10 minute or that one hour task, you know, you can focus what should you automate, right? Uh, at the end of the day, again, you want to limit the dwell time, but you also want to make, it sh make sure your data is accurate in your workflow. How many people have gotten a ticket and then the information on that user ending has been completely stale or inaccurate? Uh, right? And that happens. Is that anything you're going to be able to do about that? Probably not right there in that instance, or even your team might not have the ability, but how can that be automated? How can uh, essentially an employee transfer be automated? If you don't, again, a lot of environments don't have identity management uh, or orchestration kind of doing a lot of that workflow. Flow. Formerly, I came from Fortune 500 that had that, and then I went to a small local government that didn't have any of that. We actually used a, a pretty basic, uh, our, our HR system, mm -hmm. exports a uh, uh, username, job title, uh, phone number, work location, et cetera, et cetera, and it gets fed into every AD area. So we know that as long as they've registered that, that mm -hmm. work change or job change or location change with HR, mm -hmm. it's going to get done. This is exactly what I was looking for someone kind of to say because that's a lot of places, for some reason, just don't do that. And they have that capability because the HR system might just be this thing that's in the, that, 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 you know, maybe the HRIT people have access to, but really, a lot of people don't, in the small areas, don't do things like that, uh, and things get stale over time, especially, and, and again, I'm talking about um, small, small, medium business, as well as uh, local governments and things like that, because things just change so much over time, it just gets stale, and it's never really a problem until, you know, security looks at it, or there's stale records for something, there's not a lot of things, because payroll might still be going fine. HR social record, but again, Active Directory, does someone really care that you're not a senior in your title or your phone number change real quick? Does the phone system really um, push down to AD and stuff like that? Can you really call? Do you really know where those users are located? Do you have cube numbers? Things like that. Um, those can help um, have the accurate data and make the data integrity uh, a lot more viable to, again, do automation. I'm not saying that 99%, you know, 100% of your whole environment has to be accurate to do automation, but it's something you really need to review before you start imp uh, implementing all these things. What were you saying you did in the Fortune 500 but not in the other company? Oh, we, I mean, we had, we had large identity management systems that did a lot of orchestration and auto provisioning and deprovisioning with the click of a button. It's just because it was just there, right? And so we, we paid for that. So, so I mean, without, the, without that kind of automation or without that knowledge, how, I don't know how you would even track. Uh, if somebody moves from HR with access to critical, uh, you know, employee data to finance and suddenly gets finance, now they've got both. You know, if you're not tracking that they left. You're not revoking that access. Right. I, I mean, uh, a lot of places uh, when they do a full active directory review, or you sit down a pen tester or a risk assessment comes in and runs something like Bloodhound. Uh, how many people are familiar with Bloodhound? Um, runs Bloodhound, you know, and there's just stuff everywhere. Uh, there's delegation issues, there's, they didn't even know um, half the things had 
delegation all the way up to you know need a server admin or something like that because someone needed access. Some uh, fiscal department needed access to RDP into a, a server that had a fat client on it, and then also he had he has server admin for all the servers, right? I mean, there's just things like that uh, can happen, especially in your, in your low budget environment, low resources, and a large amount of staff, uh, which happens a lot. So one of the things that we had before we got our new HR system was we had a leap request built in SharePoint. Mm -hmm. And so it would look at Active Directory, and if your information wasn't correct, then you couldn't send it to your manager unless your manager was correct because mm -hmm. you know then it would go to someone else and they would say you don't work for me mm -hmm. you didn't get your lead so it was you know it came down to the employee saying i want to take my lead get my information correct mm -hmm. that's interesting and that makes it more personal right yeah um, uh, so if i mean you can't take lead then then suddenly you want the system fixed. right Right. Not saying that you should just do that for everyone, but yeah, definitely though. Uh, you know, make it a little more personal. It, it uh, was it was sort of a side effect of mm -hmm. having it in that system. Um, from an MSP and MSSP, what happens when you guys go into an environment um, and you get hired by a and and you know they buy your blinky boxes and their unicorn tools and you go into a a, a company or or entity and they just don't have any type of data integrity for your Blinky boxes and unicorn systems still went off. Just, what what would be interesting? No one knows who you guys are in the audience. They don't know what MSPs are, but it's just curious. It becomes best effort delivery then. Um, Informing them what lack of visibility they'll have. That's correct. Now, do you usually because you know if you do a proof of concept, you might know that ahead of time. But you know, if they think it's going to solve the world, what um, do you guys also offer? Like, what, what do you? Ideally, you tell them beforehand. Yeah. If you can get a sales meeting. <laughs> Temper of expectations going in. Okay. Um, you try to give them a plan for what it is that they need to develop, where they yeah. need to go, tell them where they are, mm -hmm. um, and then once they tell you this is how much they want to spend and the service they want to buy, you give best effort to them. As anyone that's had um, MSP services before. Or uh, um, uh, have they have they come in claim things, uh, which is fine because it probably does do what they say it does in some aspect. But then realize that it's dependent on a lot of data structures that you just don't have. Anyone? No. Okay. You guys implement good things. Huh? Yes, we do. <laughs> um, again. Uh, uh, going on. <laughs> All right, so as we discussed, uh, kind of going right into it again, key things before automation and uh, just generally life. Um, foundational security practices need to exist. You need an inventory, you need CMDB, you need asset classification. I know a lot of you guys are professionals, a lot of you have incident response, automation, even uh, experience. This is kind of not new to you, but again, um, asset classification. Um, uh, to be able to de develop those workflows and the data classification. Do you guys have, for asset classification, do you guys just put that right in your CMDB? Uh, do you have a separate system? What are you guys, what are you guys, what are you guys doing? Combination of both. Combination of both? Anyone else? I want to start calling on other people now. Yeah, we got our, our gold star people here. We're the girl in our help desk system. Help desk system? Okay. The CMDB or some form that's attached to it? How many people's help desk system or ticketing system connects directly with their security operations or SIM or anything like that for enrichment data? No? The MSSP, of course, theirs does. <laughs> well, we can drive it depending on what the customer has. We can, yeah. we can data mine some information. Data mine, okay. <laughs> right. How many people do a CSV dump of the CMDB from your ticketing system? And at least just have it queryable by your security systems or inject it in there. Anyone? No? Kind of. Kind of? We have a certain it's, it's, it's a similar thing to the HR database thing, right? For uh, employee data going into AD. Why wouldn't you think it would be very similar to do it into some of your uh, you know, events and event management, things like that? I'm not saying the whole database needs to be put in your SIM, but. Uh, when you get an alert from a system, maybe your DHCP scope uh, and reverse lookups work, 
uh, or maybe, um, uh, but then do you know exactly who that person's attached to, who owns that asset from your SIM? I mean, not to pull out of the description here, but we get a lot of that information from the, we tied from the, the hive. hive. Yeah, we tied the hive to uh, our DNS. Uh, Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have a guess what tool we're going to pick here soon? <laughs> So you have a large uh, hive uh, instance then? We're still plan. building. Huh? I planted it in him? there. I actually no, know no, we're, we're actually we're actually pretty fresh with it. Uh, we're okay. We're still building you know modules onto it and uh, we're linking it wherever we can. So but it's, it's I have, I had a cookie. <laughs> I'd give it out. So yeah, that's uh, that's very so it's exactly what I'm I'm leaning towards, right? Uh, but a lot of people don't have those type of security orchestration and management uh, systems um, uh, because to buy something like that equivalently is very expensive. Um, it's something that you'd have to additionally budget for, and I assume that everyone in the past five years has already just got budgeted for their their Splunk instance or their login instance or their vulnerability management instance or their staffing instance, right? How do you go back and say, hey, now I need this whole other piece just to connect everything? like? Now, how do you make that um, that uh, that whole um, kind of uh, story to the executives to get on board with that? Right? How do you do that? How do you tell that story? All right? Anyone else do anything like that? Oh, you said kinda. Yeah, um, I don't. So the other guy on our team mainly handles. He he came from system administration. He handles more of the data going here and there, and I mm -hmm. handle the. <clears throat> Anyone else have an IT ticketing system? I'm going to start with some basic questions here. Get people involved. Yeah. Homegrown. Homegrown. Okay. Is it is it feeding into your security? Some of you guys. No. Nothing. So if you got an alert from something and you had to know the owner and everything, how long would that take you guys to know exactly what even that asset is before you can triage it? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay. Right. And, and that sounds like, oh, 20 minutes isn't a bad time, but imagine you get like 30 alerts, right? Um, <laughs> at least. And, I, and again, that's an at least yeah. thing, right? <laughs> Um, that 20 minutes really gets, uh, you know, very frustrating, very fast. Uh, because again, all you're doing is logging into another system and essentially querying another database that is all probably just a um, text file anyway, or right. some form, right? It's just, you know, again, all that data can easily be mapped into uh, your other systems at this point. All right, so I've beaten that down. Um, Again, open source, if you can support it. A lot of things I'm going to be talking about here are open source. Uh, one one uh, gentleman already mentioned, the Hive. Um, again, how many people have an IPAM? Working on one. IPAM? Just paid for one. Paid for one. <laughs> Solar winds? No. I thought you said you had a paid for one. Oh no, I'm paying. <laughs> Those are the best. Yeah. Those are the best. Pay for one, for one. Giant room of just all the assets. Go. <laughs> You're like, where, the which secure. one is it? It's, it's very secure. secure. No one if you have, well, you have one analyst in the middle, it has a rotating uh, thing. And you just look around. Notes. All sticky notes just everywhere. A scrum board of your assets. You just need armed guards and guards at the doors. So yeah. It's the most secure. There you go. So we did that when we did uh, DHCB out. Deep security. You got to. Uh, <laughs> No, I was like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> nice. So, um, kill me. For a while, the PHP IPAM is an awesome solution. You're, so did you read my description? Did I just no, I didn't out, actually. I was, <laughs> huh? I didn't realize you were going into that. Jeez, <laughs> all right. You got to leave. You just got to leave. <laughs> you're, you got the cookie now, you're just... Yeah. You should play I don't know if you're trolling me or if you're just... <laughs> We sent them your slides yesterday. That's what I was like, <laughs> really? What's going on? Uh, we're going to be best friends. <laughs> so, um, again, had an IPAM. Uh, how many people have Microsoft Active Directory? How many is that attached to some type of enterprise EA in some form? Yes. I would hope so if you're a business. I mean, even it's the lowest enterprise agreement. Um, you know, Microsoft has an IPAM in that, right? Um, 
you have to set it up, but it's uh, it is in there again uh, through you know doing DHCP, you can do IPAM, um, you can do a lot of things. A lot of people don't really realize that, um, and it can do things other than Microsoft assets. Um, how many how many people know that they can import and then also manage Linux systems in a subset, pretty much from Microsoft, like SCCM and uh, um, and uh, Microsoft IPAM. Through SCCM, I got that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many people did not know that and are kind of surprised about that? No? That's killing me. So it's mind blown. <laughs> All right, not really mind blown. But again, it, it's about reviewing what you systems have and what their actual capabilities are. Um, again, um, a lot of these systems um, uh, you can get for free from something. Again, I'm not suggesting to go and uh, replace your entire environment with open source or just take anything off of GitHub. Uh, definitely review. Uh, we've, uh, especially not MSPs. Um, <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, uh, but. Uh, I thought we were going to get along there for a minute. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> um, so, a lot of these things can be put in there, but again, review them. Um, we've gotten to a stack of open source products. Um, where uh, where I work at, uh, but it has taken a time. We've had a lot of uh, uh, battles there, a lot of war stories and things like that. Um, we've rebuilt things multiple times. Uh, uh, you know, things like PHP, IPAM are, are something to look at. There are other ones out there too, um, uh, as well that people use just as well. Um, I can't name off. If there's a one of the people just left, so I was going to have her um, share some, but um, uh, there are a lot of things out there. Um, again, uh, looking at, and how many people actually do, for that have small environments, and map their environment and do like end diffs? They actually do diffs of the end maps. Raise your hands, yes, I see nods. Do you, just, do you just load up the end diff and you review it every? I just started getting uh, started using that okay. in the last couple of months or so. How many people have vulnerability? Uh, some type of scanning engine. What happens when it scans and there's something new on your network? What happens? So um, we use uh, NASA's okay. professional, and they recently did away with the APIs. Um, so I wrote a custom tool that uses the APIs to scan data back. Mm -hmm. And then it throws it into a custom tracker, and it compares it each week to the new scans. If it's not there anymore, it marks it as closed. If it's mm -hmm. new or reopened, you know, stuff like that. Okay. And, um, and where does that run from? That runs from a server, or that runs from like your machine, server. like your desktop? Server. We have, we have an internal and an external scanner. So, okay. Uh, multiple locations. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, that's fine. I, I, that's, that's, again, oh, yeah. it's very creative design. Right, um, and that's what a lot of people are, are finding out is that they're going through. And some of your your products, uh, again, being that's professional, it makes sense too. But if you had like, um, I know some of these products, like yeah, it will give you an end, diff, it will give you a diff. But like, what do you do from that? You know, I'm really gonna like dig into to you guys responding here and, and sharing some stuff um, if we feel comfortable. Um, uh, just to touch on, you were talking about like the uh, the emails um, mm -hmm. being malicious, and one thing in, in the button. So one thing we did, um, we wrote the custom macro that we deployed in our environment to send those headers, mm -hmm. and, uh, it, and it also forwarded <coughs> copy to a monitored mailbox. Mm -hmm. And then we wrote an app that goes through that email and pulls out links, uh, does DNS lookups on it once it has the IPs and everything. It then feeds them to Google State Browser API, uh, Cisco Umbrella, and a couple other API services that we pay for uh, to kind of generate a report. Is that all custom? Yeah. You need to talk to the Hive guy. That's what <laughs> 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 uh, so, but that's good though. It's that's very convoluted. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm the only guy coding it right now. No, and that's and that's what all, like 3,500 plus environment mm -hmm. person environment. So it's it, it work in progress, but it's it's working. No, definitely. So again, uh, workflow orchestration. Again, you can have scripts, workflow engines, platforms, all kinds of things like that. Um, we're going to be again. It, it comes down to as some of you guys answering stuff here. Uh, skilled staffing with passion. Um, again, skilled staffing with passion uh, is worth more than any product out there. 
um, and it's the best thing that any, I think security operations to, uh, environment um, and department can have. Um, again, you need that skilled staffing. Not everyone has to be a developer, but I'm telling you, you have people with, I don't even say development skills, but curiosity skills with intelligence um, go a long way. Um, if you start really developing a lot of code base, uh, we have even um, implemented our own Git repository internally that can do code versioning um, and a lot of things. So a lot of our engineers are even doing large PowerShell scripting and things like that. Um, where you can start sharing information and even get code reviews. Um, uh, we haven't gotten, and even if you have developers on staff, they might be able to help at least review the code of some of the engineering scripts and things that a lot of the security operators are starting to build. Because uh, a lot of development is starting to happen, customization, doing custom APIs, uh, and a lot of the other places of the uh, environment and operations and, and business don't really operate like security does, at least at this time. Obviously, development does, right? We're going towards the DevOps models and things like that. But how many infrastructure guys, you know, I mean, they might be running scripts and stuff, but playing with APIs and stuff, my experience is that security is the is kind of the people that are looking in to make sure all the APIs are connected. What's the ability of this product? We got this. Uh, product that we paid X amount for, it has all these capabilities, all these APIs, but you have to develop them, you have to connect them, you have to set the alerts up. Um, so, I did have uh, slated a, uh, a break right here, um, but I think I'm just going to keep going unless anyone wants to walk out. I think we're all adults here, right? <laughs> yeah? No children? Debatable. Debatable. All right, cool. Uh, tool time. Uh, on a budget here. Um, we're going to get into some of the tools a little more in depth. Again, um, I wish this was a little hands-on shop. Uh, maybe next year, I think we talked about developing a lot of stuff. Uh, the Hive and running even an entire Hive and um, uh, instance inside uh, the CTF. Um, and doing a lot of enrichment, a lot of observables and things like that. Again, I'm going to start, I'm not expecting you to read some of this stuff here, but Again, if you have the, the even the smallest environment can do these things. A uh, one-man IT shop can go online, get some nmap stuff, nmap your friend. Uh, you can write it uh, nmap ndiff, um, and you can have these batched and you can have them run. Um, and if you have a large environment, start um, start with a specific subnet. Uh, hopefully, you have some type of subnetting uh, structure, um, and start with something. What do you want? Um, uh, so yeah, so hopefully you have, um, uh, just target small. If you have, if you know your HR team or your, your law department or your some type of critical uh, team is very sensitive, start running NDIFs on that specific, those assets so that, that asset, um, uh, wherever that is on the network and making sure nothing else is popping up. Before we all take photos of that screen, are we going to, is there a way to get a copy of this? All these slides will be there. I just like people taking pictures of it. <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough. Yeah, so all these will be distributed. I'll have uh, slide notes um, as well. So there's a lot of supporting, so you don't have to, like that's a, that's a picture, right? Um, I'll let you know the real code and stuff like that. Um, uh, again, uh, I'll have a lot of uh, links for training OVA, or, uh, training VMs and things like that that you can get um, for all the products and stuff that we talk about here. Uh, so you can kind of play with your own environment. I uh, hope the next time I have this workshop to have all those, again, those training environments up and running and a bunch of test accounts so people can actually start logging in, uh, looking at some uh, uh, inventory classification systems, tying it to uh, logging and lookup tables, and then uh, enriching the data through like a security operations and management system. And that's really where you start to get a lot of, it seems like a lot of work at first, uh, but you, once you get it, you, you really can't live without it. Um, so. Next one here is again scanning SMB shares. How many people are familiar with SMB? Okay. All right. How many people are familiar with uh, the versions of SMB? What is your favorite version of SMB? <laughs> no version of SMB. <laughs> yeah, so how many people are, are, are have SMB v1? that they are trying to decommission. It's happened, it's there, I know it's there. Um, 
Are you tracking it? What just to explain some of your if you can. I know this is a little sensitive stuff, but I want security things. We're gonna trust some collector. All friends here. Except it's recorded and we'll, we'll be on the internet. <laughs> so, uh, and those people are assholes. <laughs> yes, they are. Imagine how good you're doing letting people know that everyone has problems and we're all talking them through. <laughs> our, our environment. And shout out your company name when yeah. you're you real speak. loud. Oh, real <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> um, no, so uh, our, our, our company has um, been around for quite a while. Um, at several points of its existence mm -hmm. in the Wild West when it came to purchasing hardware or software and uh, the, yeah, the, bring overall, that card. the overall company would basically find some more companies and then buy them and say you're part of us now, we put our name in their office and then walk away and don't talk to them for years basically. Mm -hmm. So now we're kind of trying to bring everybody under, under the umbrella again and um, we're finding things that, you know, shouldn't really be there. Right. Right. Some, some rogue, rogue IT going on there, right? Shadow IT. Yeah. I like rogues. I, do that, so. I, I would just like to point out that we just ripped the bandaid off, shut off SMD one And the only th it broke two things in our environment. One of them was a secure compliance. <laughs> that was still running open source SMB code from the 90s. You hear that MSPs in the room? <laughs> Same. Nice. Okay. What was the other thing printers? They were both networking gear. Yeah. One was a security gear, one was not. Anyone else have any war stories with SMB V1? Copiers. Copiers, yeah, those are, those are quite the, the beasts. Anything? MSP? Do you guys do you guys monitor for SMB V1? Yeah? Depends on the customer. Yeah. There you go. Depends on customers. Some customers don't care about SMB. Some customers don't care about a lot. <laughs> you can pan tilt that over. <laughs> okay, yeah, so again, uh, uh, a lot of things, again, these are two examples for Nmap. There's a lot of Nmap scripts. I'm sure that, uh, how many people are very familiar with Nmap? Right. Now, how many people have really messed around with the, 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 the N scripts and things like that, and SE scripts and things like that? I'm sorry? Do you have success with those? Uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to paste them before. But yeah, I can copy and paste them, and I can I can tell if I can get if I get like valuable information. Back. Usually, I get told by the infrastructure guys that my Nmap scans are shutting off VMs. Um, <laughs> See, now now we're getting into it. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's uh, everyone's awake. <laughs> We're shut down infrastructure. Yeah, <laughs> that's because it was insecure. Yeah, exactly. Right. We blue screened our uh, our uh, phone server. Blue screened the phone server. Any other war stories on that? How many calls you get about that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no raise hands. Okay. All right. So yeah. So definitely. Um. Uh. I recommend. Um. Uh. The. the, the the scripts are a little um, interesting, but uh, again, understanding some of this stuff, um, getting maybe uh, partnering with somebody, if you have someone in the infrastructure or team that does like Bash or um, any type of uh, awk or uh, any type of other Python development, uh, if you have those people, your capabilities run, have a lunch and learn with them, have um, connect with them, uh, take just literally an MMAT class. Find an MMAT class, take it. Um, there's a lot of capabilities you can have, you can do when you can customize things. A lot of the code you'll find uh, on Nmap uh, is, is usable, but then again, it has to be configurable for your environment. Uh, you need to know um, kind of what it's doing. You don't want to shut off network infrastructure. Uh, it, it probably will happen. Go against a test environment, uh, but uh, definitely, even the smallest shop can run Nmap, do some diffs, at least even just a basic scan and a diff. Um, and uh, you can get a lot of useful information. You'll be surprised what you find your network if that's anything from, you know, IoT cameras that 
people set up in their you know offices or, or screens to all kinds of crazy things you'll find on there. And then that's stuff that you really want to get off your network. Some people might not even realize it's on the network, um, like themselves. They're just like, oh, I plugged it in to start working, so I started using it so I could use my Alexa at work. You know? <laughs> so. Change the music at home. While exactly. Working. Exactly. Um. So again, I'm going to beat it down. Uh, important things um, after the basics is again inventory classification processes. Um, uh, again, consider centralized logging. How many people have centralized logging? Centralized logging. Okay. What does that mean to you guys? To you, and I'm not saying you're gonna, you know. Well, all our logs are in one place. <laughs> That's fine. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. Okay. Is is uh, does that go to? I'm just gonna play devil's advocate here. Do you have like a specific NTP server? Is everything on a specific NTP server for UTC? So all those, or not UTC, but any type of maybe ours are UTC. But. <laughs> uh, we leverage a cloud solution for all our logging. Oh, so, just put it in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. just throw it in the cloud. Oh, it's Storage is cheap. Okay, so it gets cloud time. Yes. Cool. All right. Answer done. Okay. <laughs> well, centralized logging. How's that? How's that working out? Huh? It's there. <laughs> it's there. All right. It's great, but the volume of data is really hard. Right. The ability to interpret what you get huh? is the yeah. issue. Okay. All right. So, so in our entire environment, we, we have centralized the logging, but for the years and years of things we've just done improperly, mm -hmm. um, we were in that it hasn't really been storing everything that we were told that it was storing. So. Um, <laughs> We're going, we're going through now, and um, I, I guess the cause is the amount of data. I mean, that's that's always an issue. Okay. So we're we're I'm writing. I'm helping to write the processes to deduce all the data. Deduce. Okay. Yeah. So definitely. What else? Centralized logging? Not really. Kind of. Using the high for that too. No, it's just it's just a lot of data. We try to go back against it, and often are you using an open talking. source solution for oh, centralized yeah. logging. Okay, I was wondering. No. How, how, <laughs> 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 uh, okay, good. You didn't see my slide. That's verification. <laughs> you skipped that slide. I guess so. You didn't pay enough. No. I guess not. Awesome. So yeah, storage is a huge thing. If you have uh, uh, centralized logging, um, any any of those centralized logging components, uh, open source. Yeah, uh, for, for a lot of the custom stuff that I've been doing, um, I leverage uh, the Elk Stack. Elk Stack, okay, so it's full, yeah, so you're, um, any, anything specific, I would say, um, <coughs> build of the Elk Stack, like something like, like uh, or just full straight Elk? Okay. There's some yeah. combinations of Elk Stack out there yeah, that kind of have... Things built on top of that ingest data. A little. We we have a so we still use Kibana, but I also have a custom front end that I've been working on. Mm -hmm. But okay, is that also then essentially Azure SIM too, or no. do you guys have a separate SIM that that things are going to? So we we so what? Uh, curious. We have a separate tool that can be used as a SIM, but it's not really used for that. Okay. Kind of. It, it, it's a mix. It, it's. Okay. Anyone have an open source sim here? Has anyone ever heard of a product called Sim Monster? You looked at that? It's interesting. I just, I'm not, I'm not, we're not going to go over that, um, but uh, I'm just trying to throw people off there. But uh, um, it is another product we'll get, though, um, as we're talking through it. Um, again, data enrichment, event enrichment, again, accuracy, accuracy and completeness of data is essential. Um, to not even just automation, but instant response. Um, especially if something really happens. Um, and you don't want to go to one of your executives, your CTO, your CIO, or something and be like, yeah, you know, we would have, we just didn't know what this asset was. Because I can guarantee you they assume they know where machines are at and what they're doing, who they assigned to. Uh, did, you know, I've been in places where uh, people get, leave the company, and all of a sudden that department just hoards their machines because they know how long it takes IT to get a machine out there 
on uh, they're just sitting there and they're just used and then they're they're given and they're, like, he's like, oh, we never have requests for a laptop. Like, oh yeah, we already have them. They're like, what? And you know, that could be like four or five months down the road, right? So. Oh, you, you so to, to kind of give some funny insight because. I, Insight. I'm, Let's go. It's here. I, I, I'm all it's a about, workshop. We're working here. I, I'm all about keeping the laptops in um, at, at, at the company, but uh, recent policies in the past couple of years at our company, um, C level uh, gets the heat their machine completely. That is very interesting. Wow. Oh yeah. Insane. Oh yeah. They, they, now they have to be wiped. Like there's a whole process. So they've. Um, C level employees get to keep their laptops. Oh yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's a huge. Say that of course, there's been pushback. I mean, it's, it's a huge mess. So, um, what, See, what when I you didn't think it could get worse. So, <laughs> so, so I, uh, what I have implemented to basically make it acceptable is um, every every laptop that we've had to let C level keep, they're completely okay with it being wiped and being yeah, reinstalled. And I said, okay. okay, well, if you're okay for it to be wiped, then you're okay for me to replace the hard drive and give you a brand new machine basically. Mm -hmm. Because I would feel more comfortable knowing that you just have give a machine and then repurposing that internally. Yeah, well basically I'd rather go to the store and buy the machine. No, they they keep the laptop but we replace the hard drive. Oh okay. You so so okay. and then we destroy the hard drive because I don't I don't feel comfortable letting it go. Oh okay. interesting. But okay. and then certain certain so that depending on what C level um exact has left because we've had a bunch of postponing and things change. Um, it sounds like a fun environment. <laughs> 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 so much fun. I, I can't contain it sometimes. Um, de depending on what C level leaves or the, or the directors that are under them, sometimes we've had directors actually get to keep their laptops. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my boss goes you know, to battle and basically says, hey, this, this is against the policy. And basically, you have people that are like, guess what? We, you know, we approve these things. Do so. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you use LoJack or like absolute software or anything to track laptops? That would be fun. So, yeah. Conti yeah. Getting, well, this, this is more getting back to the automation. So mm -hmm. talk about, because we have the same thing. So they throw the laptop in the drawer, pulls it out two months later. It's like, oh yeah, here we go. Uh, we actually have, I mean, we run automation against our AD. If the computer hasn't logged in in two months, mm -hmm. it's kicked out of the domain. It's out, if, yeah. You know, if a lo user hasn't logged in in three months, the user is, uh, is disabled. You might have field workers or mm -hmm. users that, that never log in. If you oh, yeah. log in, you're disabled. Now, do you have exceptions to that? No. Well, I mean, service codes. Oh, right? Yeah, right. Service codes. So, but we don't have exceptions in the organization. Mm -hmm. We actually have higher stringencies on consultants and vendors. Yeah. IDs. Okay. Yeah. yeah so um, again, if you guys, uh, how many people automatically terminate a a user account AD that has not been used or logged in automatically? I mean, that's a pretty terminate, terminate or disable. 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 Yeah. disable. Right. So it's a basic process. Right. It might be maybe not automated, but batched, or you have someone run it so weekly. Um, how many people do that for the actual machine objects, right, as you mentioned? So we, 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 we actually have an issue with that. Um, mm -hmm. I was, so yeah. our... Um, I need to give a presentation, right? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry if I talk too much. No, no, this is what I want. I want a discussion. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we have, a, have had a federal division, and um, some of the texts were, you know, questionable areas, third world countries, um, on basis and such, and they wouldn't be able to connect online for 60 plus days sometimes. So finally when they get back online, and I'm like, hey, you, you got to call us, and like, we would have to walk through a process, and I'm like, and um, there's always pushback to try to bend the rules, like, well, we need to create exceptions for this, and I'm like, first off, you're in, you're in an area where if your laptop gets stolen, it, it's not going to be a good thing. And, um, so yeah, it, it's, yeah. it's definitely a lot of war stories with machine object, uh, um, uh, uh, disabling machine objects. Um, I know we have a lot of emergency operations that are used in certain instances that might only be used once a year annually, certain things. You need to really make sure that you know your organization's uh, uh, procedures and policies and how if you have redundant or DR equipment, things like that. Uh, that you just you do you are aware of those things um, and things like that, and as well as your uh, if you do have a desktop support team and things like that, that they're also aware of uh, those procedures and processes once you put them in place. 
Um, and that's just a war start we had with doing the same thing uh, way back when. Uh, that uh, they were they were sitting in laptops, staging them, um, and then just sitting them there when people would go um, would 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 leave the company, and then all of a sudden they would go to try to reimage them or put them back on the network, and they would be disabled. Um, and it was just a process where they didn't have the rights and things like that to join back or 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 un. Uh, renew the machine account, things like that, um, and it just created a operational inefficiency right there that was overcomable, but again, you talk about all of a sudden you got an influx of 30 employees that got hired, and you need to add these machines back on and that, you, you can get into a kind of a cluster there. So, anyways, good stuff. I'm going to go through some of these tools. Again, if this looks familiar um, to some of the people. How many people have looked at PHP my uh, iPad? or an IPAM, one person. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go into the IPAM. This is just one. It's There's a lot of uh, things about the IPAM. Again, this is some of the things, an example of what it inventories. Um, and you can have more, you can have a lot of extensions on it. You can uh, do a lot of customization on it. Again, it is open source. Um, again, you have something like, uh, you have a number of subnets. Uh, this is just an example. One of these things in our example of our in our network, um, again over 1,200. Uh, you know, you got the VLANs there, um, uh, IPv4 addresses, and those are only things that are actually specifically scanned. Um, you can choose a scan and not scan things. Uh, we're not scanning IPv6. How many people track IPv6 inside their network internal? Yeah. <laughs> That's how I track it internal. Okay. How do you guys? What do you disable it on? Just on the switches? Workstations. Workstations too? Disable? We don't disable it. Don't, yeah, have it, right? Okay, interesting. Yeah, so if you do disabling uh, IPv6 on your, your network uh, stack, you might still have it in your network. Um, IPv6 also does something really fun for security people. Anyone want to know what IPv6 does? Interestingly, in the network world, One. Public address. It's a public address. What does that mean? It's routable. It's routable. So it, it, it ignores a lot of configuration that exists. If you have an IPv6 address, it is routable. It's obtainable, right? Um, it will ignore certain normal restrictions and security policies inside of networking gear because it's only, you probably only have it set for IPv6 or IPv4. Um, so it's very something very interesting to scan for when you are doing some of your passive um, scanning or analysis. Uh, if you're getting type of Windows event logs or any type of system event logs, really understand uh, IPv6 traffic. Another kind of war story share that you'll notice that even if you do have it disabled at your network layer, your workstations might still be communicating directly to other devices that have it turned on. Um, so you said you uh, disable the workstations, you disable it all the printers, right? So that's something to be uh, conscious of is the sale from the printers. Um, and the interesting thing about printers is that unless you have some, some vendors, some large print vendors don't have print management, like you can't just push out uh, unless you have a separate tool set um, uh, settings of the printers. Um, I don't know if anyone has things that they can share about how they manage their print infrastructure. Um, some of the best things I've seen is just through SNMP. Uh, but that is also, you know, manually set up unless you have some vendors that have print management operations built into all their printers, which just, just blows my mind. And if I'm incorrect and someone has some type of large vendor that has print management, unless it's one specific one that I know of, I'd be very surprised if it's some of the other. We have feet on the ground, they go around. Yep, a lot of people, yeah, yeah. Previously, there was a lot of issues with Microsoft operating systems when you removed that PPC. So, like, if you search the knowledge base, there's a ton of issues with mm -hmm. just removing it. So, I think a lot of people were scared to get it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think they put out a registry fix or something. Because you can turn it off, and then you're going to turn it off. It's good for it. For the IPAM people in the room, uh, are you guys recording on printers and IPAM? How many people's printers have static or reserved IPs? Or are they all just DHCP? Static. 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 
Uh, so there's, you could just literally load it in Taipan. Uh, very interesting thing. How many people know that they just they change the default passwords on the print management because every printer has one by default turned on? Our, our scanners um, have the credential set, so it tries to log in and pop us down. Fun stuff. You can put SSO on it. You can just yeah, you go on. It's a whole fun thing in printers. Printers have a lot of functionality. When, when, when you scan them properly, they will print page after page. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, all right. Yeah. So uh, again, going down the IPv6 number of uh, kind of going through locations. Again, you get a lot of locations in there. You can have racks. Um, how many people have rack diagrams somewhere, like of their data closets or their right? Are those just in Visio or in Excel? Visio. Yeah. Right? Wouldn't that be nice to be able to see in an IPAM or an inventory management system uh, when you're doing to know exactly where the data closet, where, it, where it's located at and things? Are, are the locations at least in the CMDB maybe? Maybe? No? Yeah. Uh, ours are so, because of SMP. We would pull out those. SMP. Okay, cool. All right. So um, I'm going to go through a little more uh, of the. Uh, PHP on IPAM, this is an example. Uh, some of this is custom to us. You can add custom fields, it's pretty easy um, uh, to, and this is just an example. Um, uh, so again, you have IP address, which is usually obtained by PHCP, some form, right? So as long as the, um, uh, it's this, the, the item's pingable, um, it will also show you, this is just an example of one IP address. There are entire subnets you can view and things like that. And you guys can, if you literally Google PHP IPAM, that's what it's called. Obviously built on PHP, but the name of it is PHP IPAM. Um, the, uh, again, you can put devices, locations, those are all drop downs, uh, put notes, tags, some of the things that we put in is vendor name, hardware, a lot of those are custom fields, POS that we track for PCI, our POS systems, things like that, DNS, <coughs> extra DNS names, some some things have extra, uh, more, you know, large, a lot more DNS names than, than just one if it's a large um, environment uh, or a, a specific uh, like VM infrastructure or things like that. We try to just denote those things, um, what's running on them and things like that. Um, and those are all like com comma delimited fields and things like that. Uh, we also have a uh, firewall. There's more on this, but this is what I want to screenshot. Um, Again, we have device type and things like that, so you can easily see all the cameras on your network and things like that without actually having to scan the network for cameras. Um, a lot of uh, vulnerability management systems or scanners will do this for you as well, like obviously device type and things like that. Again, everything costs a license, right? Um, so again, if something is like a camera or printer, um, some type of, of non-workstation device, it most likely has a static or reserved IP. Um, right, um, or at least a reserved subnet of things that is GACP scope, right? Um, so at least you would know that all these things on this subnet are most likely X device or something like that. Um, does anybody have something similar? I know you said you had a PHP on IPAM. This is kind of starting into some of the automation stuff because this is what you have to have to be able to automate some things. No, but you you kind of speak backwards because we do have we have separate products. We've got the IPAM that we utilize, but we also have a, you know, kind of a network scanner that's not sure this will all the device back by its bottom of mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we pull all the device information, you know, mm -hmm. vendors, you know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest part we have is getting the, the stuff that I can't do automated mm -hmm. with it, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who really owns it, where, you know, where is it located, mm -hmm. it, you know, those are all yep. difficult things to get into those kinds of so I'll give you a use case in automation here, because we're just like talking about random tools and security operations. Uh, but okay, imagine you have the Nmap, right? You have the Nmap diff. Um, it runs, um, say, nightly, right? It can uh, PHP IPAM, for example, has the ability to import just via CSV, and all these are just headers in the CSV, and it literally can just import large amount, and it can overwrite all it needs. Usually, the unique field is this IP address, and you can change those unique fields, so that's what it's tagging against. Um, when you import something into it, it will overwrite the fields that you want to overwrite, or by default, it just does it by um, IP address. Uh, so, um, if you have an NDIF come in, uh, you can export the CSV file, make sure that the headers match, and then you can actually import 
um, or, or, or know that when data, if, if uh, you can actually do logic where, okay, this is a new device on a network, <coughs> I know it's a new device, was it implemented in PHP IPAM um, with like say it was vendor name or agency user, or agency owner, are those things still null or not? And then you can kind of start getting reports like that and just knowing that so you can actually make sure that people are actually putting things in. Or you know what, is the criticality level not there. And you can run reports directly into in PHP IPAM as well as how many assets don't have a criticality level and things like that. And there's a lot of to overcome when you first do this because nothing has that, right? Or, or maybe you have another tool that you can import it in, right? Um, but if you don't have that after that you start doing that, um, uh, it becomes very easy to automate. And that's not automating the full process, but again, it's, it's kind of putting the task list there to be able to make sure that you have your accurate and uh, uh, useful data there. Does that make sense? Is that fine? Is that, is that yeah, and then it actually ties back to your centralized logging idea. Do you it does. You're logging everything well if all your data is coming back to IPAM and you're either comparing yeah. it manually via a report or mm -hmm. you're act automating that compare yeah. and saying, here's where you're so once you have stuff like this um, in place, there are APIs for for all usually all IPAMs, um, including PHP IPAM. You can actually put into your centralized logging. We use an open source solution, and we can actually create lookup tables. So when an IP address comes into the centralized logging, we can actually enrich all of this data and tie it to it. So then our centralized logging has all of this data uh, accessible, just because it knows the IP address and it can pull that. Right. So then you know that. Okay, this is this subnet is this you know um, owned by this agency. It's this machine, all that kind of stuff. Especially if um, you might be in an environment, and this is maybe <coughs> more unique to us, where we don't have we don't have control over some of the sub agencies under us. They might have their own IT departments, but we'll see the DHCP scope. But some of the stuff we won't have. Um, so it's very interesting once you get to a say multi-tenant or uh, environment maybe where a company has a lot of subsidiaries or where you still monitor some of their assets but only have access to a certain amount of data. Um, okay, now I'm going to get into, uh, and I don't expect people to read this specifically, but it's just to get the idea of how things work. Um, uh, we use a open source uh, solution called Graylog um, for our centralized logging. Uh, are people familiar with Graylog? Okay. All right. Um, it's there's a learning curve to get it set up depending on how large your environment is, um, but this is our just general architecture of that. Um, and uh, just to kind of go, uh, if you go through this, it's actually built off Elastic, Elasticsearch. Um, so these are the Elasticsearch uh, uh, databases here uh, with multiple shards each, um, and then you have uh, the gray log essentially interfaces. And then we have something that's called HA proxies in front of it. Um, and then uh, these are all the specific log uh, instances that are coming in right here. Um, and it's going through some normalization process right here. Uh, so these all things right here are things like um, uh, Cisco uh, firewalls here, but then Cisco routers and switches have a different one. Because essentially each ingest probably contains a different parser uh, to parse that. Right, so you're normalizing all your data as it comes through here. So are you using HA proxy to load balance? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so we get so many events uh, to certain types of, of systems that we actually have to use HA proxy to make sure that um, uh, the intricacies of the product does not break. So I use HA proxy but not so much to load balance, more as a... Um, a reporting mechanism in health. <clears throat> Not, not so much that, um, more of a um, uh, failover type thing. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that would be for redundancy. I mean, yes. Yeah. Redundancy yeah. Rather, rather than um, load balancing. Yeah, so I mean, I guess it's probably we're talking to call them the same, the same thing. Same thing. Uh, right. Uh, okay. um, so, but because uh, sometimes <laughs> we found out in the environment that we have, because we're getting uh, like probably thousands of uh, messages per second. We burst up to 20,000 messages per second, events per second that we get in. Um, so uh, we found that sometimes it just times times out um, because it's just how it works. And we're honestly still through, again, our uh, operational enhancements and learning curves and things like that. Because 
the first instance we did not have an HA proxy in place, uh, but we had to the scale. Uh, and there's white papers out there and stuff about uh, specifically gray log of how to make it more, uh, I would say, enterprise and failover uh, capable. Um, that's one of the suggestions there, and it's uh, not custom. I would say it's customized, but there are there are uh, instructions and installations on how to do that uh, for high availability. Um, so yeah, and then some of these are just different um, ingesters. So one of these is a WEF server. How many people are familiar with uh, uh, WEC and WEF in Windows? Windows Event Forwarding and Collection. How many people have Windows Event Forwarding Collection working in their environment? To a centralized WEF server, I I don't I didn't set up to be honest. With you. Okay. <clears throat> Before I get in. Okay. How many people are familiar with it? So you guys have it set up? No, we we utilize, we utilize we utilize a collection agent, not a, uh, not Windows sending. We go up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for everyone, just uh, uh, be aware of the overall architecture and capabilities of Windows. Is that um, and there's a great uh, Microsoft Ignite. Uh, I think maybe two years ago, could be far, uh, maybe three years ago, by somebody by the name of Jessica Payne, and she actually demoed and set up an entire Windows Event Collection instance uh, and Windows Event Forwarding, uh, literally within like 15, 20 minutes on stage, uh, and before that, kind of explained it. And it's very. Obviously, in the demo environment, very easy to set up. Again, you're enabling Windows Event Forwarding. You have a Windows Collection server. You're pointing to it. You have GPOs that push out, and you're getting events right. And you have to have uh, the Windows Event uh, uh, Collection server has to have certain types of uh, subscriptions and things like that to be able to get them. And, and there's a whole setup. And I recommend <coughs> researching that and seeing that because again, that's a lot of data that is better than that you could get and you could analyze better than um, you might have uh, an agent right now running on your machines, or you might just not be able to get getting Windows event logs. So you can do a lot of things from Windows event logs, even if it's just your domain controllers at first. Um, so you can at least get logons and all kinds of other types of uh, domain controller activity um, from that. Uh, it's very useful. Um, so we have that. Uh, we collect everything under the sun. Uh, so that's every Windows event firewall, um, all, we have a whole subscription uh, for Windows events that we get, um, and we monitor those and have alerting and things set up like that. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff that you can set up with that. Um, there's also, uh, I'll have it in my notes afterwards, it's a great talk that was at DerbyCon um, that uh, was, did statistical analysis and um, essentially triaging of, of the most common attack vectors and capabilities pen testers use, and just essentially doing logic between, I think, 12 different Windows event IDs and being able to detect everything under the sun, including uh, you know basic Mimi cats, basic uh, um, uh, credential theft, uh, remote uh, desktop um, anomalies, and things like that. Um, now, if you start to get an obfuscation and things like that, obviously it might, it might not be as, as uh, um, as useful, but again, a lot of basic stuff you can get from just 12 Windows event IDs. I'm sure the MS, MSPs know that um, because they don't have to do logic between like 15 different Windows, Windows event IDs and they're good to go. No? Am I wrong or am I right? It sounds like a jail. Am I wrong or am I right? But is it though? I mean, I mean, right? Similar or they correct me if I'm... There's other things. Somewhat there. accurate. Somewhat accurate, yeah. Okay. Can you forward on? Hmm? Can you forward on? other devices, other Correct. Right. So uh, we have our web server uh, that then forwards to our centralized login. Actually, I meant from your centralized login. Yes, you can. So um, it depends on your product. So you're talking about <coughs> forwarding to a SIM? Um, so depending on your SIM, uh, some do recommend that you actually forward from the web server directly. Um, and, and I know that we're, we're trying to get to the point where we're forwarding on, and then everything's actually coming from our centralized logging to whatever um, uh, SIM alerting, because our, our centralized logging can do a lot of alerting, but it's not going to do correlation. We might be able to build it in there, uh, but again, that's what our SIM's doing. Uh, we don't want to take it away. It's not replacing our SIM, but it's giving our SIM better information, and it's giving our SIM um, normalized data to be able to do the things it does better, right? Um, but a lot, a, lot of, a lot of places do recommend 
that they get the data directly from the West servers uh, themselves, just because of how the data is formatted. Um, so you actually do have, it's not depicted on this, but you'll have a collector agent or some type of, of you have to normalize the Windows event format to whatever you're filling it in. A lot of SIM vendors that you would pay for uh, have that correlation uh, or that, that, anal that I would say, uh, uh, parsing built into their product. And, you, they, and it's been developed and it's very extensive. Others, um, you have to at least uh, have some type of uh, 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 trans, uh, transporter for that. Uh, we use something called NXLog. Uh, and it actually sends it into gray log event format, so it actually can uh, translate Windows event for, uh, for, uh, format to the uh, gray log extended uh, format and things like that. And that's when you get into the really nitty gritty of the development and architecture of that. Um, uh, something like HP ArchSight or something or Splunk, they all have their way to be able to just read the Windows event uh, data because they're, um, they've developed those parsers and engines like that. Anyone have any war stories around that? So, no? Oh, go ahead. I'm just going to Oh, yeah. yeah. We, we've tried to transcend a gray log a couple different times, and every time we just keep throwing resources at it, there's like, you yeah, know, it's just not. I've been trying to repurpose maybe like, like a, you know, a VM post or something to, along those lines okay. to try and. Proof of concept it to where we could get it working, but it's always it seems like the resources are never enough for the. What's um what? How much resources have you? How many how many events per second are you trying to get messages per second? Literally, the farthest we've got is we've got it stood up and and, and we've had our system point one of our systems pointing to it and it's just so slow it's it literally used, like useless. I, at this point, it's been months ago. It's okay. The last try. Hmm. It was, in the, it was in the thousands. It was in the thousands. Once you start getting in the thousands, you it, it's not going to take. It's you're going to have to have a, a multi-tiered architecture to take that on. It's going to have the same. We had the same similar issues. That's uh, what I ran into as well. And and that's going to be honestly true with any type of centralized logging system. Uh, it's like if you have a, a Splunk or anything um, uh, similar, something like that. It, it's just going to take resources. Now, obviously, things like Splunk. Um, they might not be as many architectural layers like this, but it might actually be like that, just you might not be aware of the, because it's going to be an appliance box or in the cloud or something like that. So, um, but yeah, there's definitely a learning curve in the architectural. Um, and I recommend if you're going into the thousands, uh, again, to look at the HA proxy uh, installation documentation stuff through Go Cray Law, and you'll have a lot better experience. Um, but it is a learning curve, and it's stuff that you, you got to. We, go through. we went through about three or four different environments before we got one that was usable to start using uh, 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 company-wide. Also, the, the carry-out, I, I don't know if it's been changed, um, but I know in the last search, throwing more than, uh, what is it, 32 gigs of RAM, or no, uh, 32 gigs of memory at it, where it, uh, it starts to have issues and you get it. I went, I went to an Elasticsearch um, LCHAC training in New York, and one of the developers was telling us that basically you would run, want to run two instances. If, if, you, if you're going to give it that much memory, mm -hmm. you need to run two instances. Like, mm -hmm. don't, don't give them one of gigs of memory. And that's why we've learned similar things. I, I can't speak on the specifics of the thought of my uh, specific staffing on that. But I, I know that that was an issue in some forms. It was memory. It was something else. And that's why we actually set up uh, uh, those... Uh, um, six servers are at account um, uh, right there and they're not like all running 32 gigs they're all running only 16 gigs they're not actually that powerful but just having separate instances uh, uh, went very far in the stability of the environment uh, and that's just a learning curve of the entire you know um, elastic using something like Elasticsearch and we have our you know you get to a point where you know you might have some of the DBA developers asking you how you're using Elasticsearch because you might be the first you know people using that um, more than the rest of the whole development team or the IT team stuff like that. You know, on the, the private side of the, some of the stuff I do, that's what we find. I hate it to be honest with you. I really hate it. <laughs> I, I but I mean it, it does its for, it does its job well yeah. for us. It does. Yep. I you can quickly search a lot of stuff. Yes, I just need it. 
All right, I'm going to go in some of our specific dashboards and gray log just to show you um, some of the things. I wish this was a little like, like, because like, it's a lot clearer online, but I guess. <coughs> anyway, sorry about that. So you can actually read some of that stuff, but I'll go through it. Um, uh, again, this is our AD overview. Um, this is a, conf this is a, a um, sorry, I have to blow it um, there are a lot of templates that Greylog has um, for dashboarding. Uh, we took one and modified it. Um, again, it's very easy to create dashboards. The back end of these dashboards are just, they're just tiles. They're not even really dashboards. I mean, they're operational uh, metrics, uh, really. Um, and it's just a query format um, that uh, constantly will show you a, a query and some type of visualization. It can do just basic pie graphs uh, um, and other types of uh, just uh, visualization. It's not going to do anything like it's not going to do anything like Kibana. It's not going to do anything like an actual full da dashboard visualization tool. It's not going to be Power BI or anything like that. It's you. We've we've got, we've gotten a, um, very far in uh, having a logging centralized logging uh, environment other than our sim for our engineering and infrastructure to have access to to be able to see a lot of this data without having to give them some type of delegated access to a SIM and then trying to teach them how to use the SIM and parse through it and then do all these things. A lot more, at least in our aspect, um, that's worked well for us. Um, so if you look at some of this stuff, it's tracking RDP usage, uh, computers created, accounts created, clear text logons per Microsoft's uh, uh, things. Um, uh, Windows and Firewall data is not there, but you can see the app locker data events are down there that uh, is being tracked. Uh, failed logins all across the board. Uh, PowerShell use, um, again, and uh, batch service logons, account deletions, anti-forensics, things like this. I'm not going to go through each one of these. Uh, and these are, there's like an actual day range. So this is like seven, most of these are seven days. Um, uh, some, I think all of them are seven days. Some of them might be... Uh, uh, one day, but most of these are all seven days. Um, and this is just something that you can see and visualize very quickly to see. Um, the RDP usage is nice to be able to see if there's an influx of crazy RDP usage. Uh, and then slowly, uh, I know that some of the projects that I've been working on is is restricting and going through and setting everything through RDP gateways and, and really limiting the use of, of RDP and things like that. That's something we've been working on, so we've actually been tracking that throughout the environment. Um, uh, do some of these people see like these dashboards helpful? Anyone have dashboards like this or that useful with the products they have or anything? Just, yeah. Something similar? Yeah. yeah. I use Splunk. That's very similar. If you have Splunk, you're like, yeah, yeah you guys. So you guys got the money. Well, I tried this and <laughs> you I said I really got the money. So much. <laughs> How many people have Splunk in here? Okay. Yeah, yeah so. Uh, if you want to save like six hundred thousand billion dollars, um, uh, you could you could spend the the agony to switch over to something like Greylog. There are things that Splunk does amazingly, um, but there's a lot of things that uh, something like Greylog is essentially a lightweight version of, of Splunk capabilities. Greylog does have an enterprise version, it gives you a lot more uh, support and uh, Ease of use and and uh, simplicities that uh, Splunk has. Again, it's not going to do everything Splunk does. A lot of things that we talked about, as we mentioned, the hide, and we'll get into that. There's a lot of co components and licensing modules that the Splunk that Splunk does that does the same things. But again, you're paying a lot of money for this. Um, and if you have that and you can do that, that's great. Um, I would I would at the end of the day I would I would I would go to a Splunk instance if I could and had the resources. Um, it's definitely a beautiful tool. Save a lot of time, that's for sure. It does. So, anyone have uh, any other? No? No. All right, cool. Uh, here, I'm going to go to the other dashboard here. Again, I um, was hoping to be able to actually play with these things and give access to them. Um, but uh, this is a specific security one. This, again, tracking failed logons, uh, re failed logon reasons, um, and uh, top IPs and usage and things like that. Um, uh, these seem like large numbers, but they're not really that large. Uh, at least to the amount of data that we get in. But um, uh, how many people do not have an account lockout policy? Everyone has a lockout policy. How many people have uh, protective security groups enabled? Do people know what that that is? How many people have that enabled? 
How many have tried to enable that? That's the issue right there. So we have that enabled, and that was why that number is that large. Um, again, it's uh, dangling uh, just things out there trying to log on, scripts and things like that that we've uh, locked down. And, and, uh, it's not, it doesn't actually have any operational impact. It's just dangling things out there that need to be cleaned up um, that are attempting to uh, uh, authenticate. But protective security groups are something that you can, it is possible to enable. We have enabled it. And uh, we've used things like tracking, like tracking items like this to really see where the issues are before we did that as we mi uh, migrated users into that. Any of the hurdles around type of security groups? Like to share? It was, it was a fight with our structure and land and our PC management. Yeah, and it, it's still ongoing, but but I have a lot of questions. Windows is definitely doing some things right now, Microsoft um, uh, and Jacob Security Group is definitely a very interesting thing to look into. If you haven't looked into that, I recommend looking up some of the documentation on that and the restrictions and the default parameters it puts around a account. It's very interesting, and there's things that are probably in that documentation somewhere that you will not read and you will not see or not understand exactly what it happens, and it will. Uh, things will happen when you do that. Just, just test it and understand it. So, uh, it's fun stuff. We got the first step done, which was separating their normal logins from their. Yes. How many people do credential partitioning here? How many people know what credential partitioning really means? How many people know what credentials are? <laughs> there we go. I got there. Now we'll meet in the middle. Um, so credential partitioning, I'm sure a lot of people are aware of that, but that's when you have separate, essentially separate accounts, separate credentials for certain activities, uh, and then enforcing that, you know, preferable and usually required. Uh, so uh, usually your domain admins, uh, Keys of the Kingdom, have uh, some type of account uh, that only has that access. Uh, those, those accounts cannot log on to... Uh, uh, end user stations. They can only log on to domain controllers. You only log on to domain controllers. You don't log on to servers. You don't log on to your PC. You don't log on to um, a end user's PC with a domain admin credentials. Because what happens when you do that? What happens? What happens? It captures what? Caches the credentials, right? <clears throat> for elevated account or accounts that need elevated or have that privilege, um, gives RSA tokens in order to log into them. No, on top of that, that's good. Yeah, so you have two-factor, two -factor. multi-factor, some type of other factor authentication. So, yeah, it, and that how many people were using uh, Microsoft MFA last week? <laughs> no one. <man. laughs> good answer. <laughs> <laughs> no one. Not on Monday. Not on Monday. No, no MFA Monday. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's that's very interesting. Uh, we've uh, we have experimented, um, or we have on the tool to experiment with things like UB keys and things like that. Um, uh, right now, um, we have specific BDI machines that they can only log into the domain, um, add an account for that BDI machine, not their actual computer. So it's gotten those credentials off. Uh, those uh, the actual end user machine that you you email all that stuff with. Uh, credential partitioning can go even further to the server environment as well as the end user environment, um, and then also the end user to, to escalate to local admin um, and things like that if needed uh, in very uh, special use cases. That is called. Uh, how many people are familiar with the Microsoft tiered model, security tier model? I recommend, uh, if you don't look that up, it will be, I'll put that in some of my notes too. It's not really a security operations automation, um, but it is uh, also, um, some people just feel like there's a jackass in here right now. <laughs> uh, so, the, uh, um, so look that up. Uh, they have a tiered model going from tier two, tier one, tier zero. Um, look that up. Uh, again, that will help enrich and, 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 uh, and focus your automation capabilities. Uh, so right now, uh, instead of having to log all the machines that domain admins could have access to, we only have to log certain machine or, 
or put alerts around certain machines because it's literally enforceable only on those machines. It helps your automation when you do some of these segmented uh, accounts and cre uh, credential partitioning. And it also helps you once you do that credential partitioning to actually put people in the protective users group. Because then again, it's only domain admin account anyway. You put that in protective. If you try to put a regular user in protective users group, that is going to be very interesting. Because again, a regular user does things that that, will, that policy will enforce and make it the account usable potentially. I'm sure there's probably a way to do it. I'm sure Microsoft will tell you, but um, it's definitely usable at the, the higher tier levels. Okay, um, now I'm going to go on to SNMP monitor. How many people are familiar with Libra NMS? Anyone heard of this? Anyone do have like a SolarWinds equivalent or some type of network monitoring system? Huh? Netmon. Netmon. SolarWinds. SolarWinds. What's up, Gold? Huh? What's up, Gold? What's up, Gold? Okay. What's up, Gold? Okay, cool. You know that a lot of those network monitoring tools, like What's Up, Gold, as well as SolarWinds, have an IPAM, IPAM built in. Um, I don't know if What's Up Gold specifically has an extra license on it, but I know that Solar Ones usually, I could be completely wrong on this, has an IPAM license if you have Solar Ones. Uh, you can use an IPAM just like you could PHP IPAM, um, just to let you know that a lot of your tools might have some of these capabilities, um, and you can take advantage of them. Uh, this is something that we use. Uh, it actually connects, it has native integration with PHP IPAM. That would be great if they had the same owners. Huh? That would be great if they had the same owners. They don't have the same owners, but they have native integration. No, no, no. What yeah. I'm saying is, is I've got a, one group that owns SolarWinds and another group that manages the iPad and they don't talk. Oh, wow. I, we really have a very unique, similar environment. <laughs> um, that's why we created the iPad. Uh, we actually in our environment. Um, but, uh, very interesting. Do you have a, a separation of your wide area network team and your, like, say, local area network team? Yes. That's what it is. Yeah, that's what we have, too. Um, just because of the amount of buildings and facilities we have, it's set up like that, and they're separate teams. Um, so, it's interesting. Uh, so, again, this is, uh, I want to get to the point of this. Again, it's a network modern tool. It's getting SNMP uh, information, so you can actually get, how many people are, what the information you have is, when there's a config change on a router or switch, does, would your SIM know that something was modified to a critical component and alert you of that? All changes. Hmm? All changes go right to your SIM? And you just review those? Like every... <laughs> it, it, I, I'm, I'm just it, very curious. It depends. So all changes go, you know, they're logged. And they're logged. Right. Um, but specific ones would create okay. like a notable. A notable action? Okay. How many other people would notice a, a, a route change on one of their hundreds of routers? And would that, would you know that? Anyone do any automation around that um, of approvals of, of network changes like that, config changes? The network team has, uh, they use Jira to track all their changes and requests. Really? They use Jira? That's interesting. Um, but mm -hmm. it, it's convoluted because we have ten different teams that use ten different ticketing systems, mm -hmm. and they don't all talk to each other. And they're like, put a ticket in. And they're like, okay, so you put a ticket in, you don't hear anything for three months, and you're like, you're constantly updating the ticket. Like, I'm not getting anything, you know. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so changes are tracked, but we I feel that we have a lot of um, group net net admins that. Uh, Make a lot of changes, and then I'll see a ticket come in with like 30 different things in it. I'm like, mm -hmm. wow, that was just put in and put all at the same time. Hmm. Okay, yeah, definitely, definitely a problem. Um, and uh, we actually have, we do have solar ones, but we have a separate Libra NMS system, so we can track <coughs> configs and changes separately and holistically, um, uh, even though there's somewhat of a redundancy. Uh, but again, it has the APIs into all of our systems that put enrichment data, things like that. Um, I'm going to skip two slides, I think, um, to right here. Uh, I'll go back to that. Um, but uh, this is an example of Libra NMS and showing a, a specific Cisco device, uh, the amount of util utilization it has. Someone poked a uh, moss up. Is it? That's what was the name of it, I thought, Masa. What was that? 
Yeah. It's Moza. I think it's Moza. Anyway. Paris' name is Moza for people on the camera. Um, <laughs> we have parrots, we have horses in here, we have all kinds of things. Um, so yeah, so this is this does the uh, the syncs and the and the configs and the changes, uh, and you can go in and, and put specific alerts around that. You can do that with solar ones. You do that with a WhatsApp goal and things like that. But again, is, is if you're doing it, um, are you doing it in a way that's then pushing back to something that you can actually see that event data quickly without going to different systems? Um, I, I'm going to go through the over here back to the last slide. I must have messed these slides up, but this is like a basic environment that we have. Um, uh, right here, um, again, we have the PHP IPAM. Um, we also utilize things with just, we have, we have multiple things that do multiple things, but they, they are focused areas. Um, so we might have a, a specific sim that things are going to. Uh, we do use OSIM in certain areas because we get better data and we want to look at those, those things with just different configurations and we don't want to, we don't have the licensing budget to pay for those, so we just custom configure OSIM on a small network, our environment, to, and again, all the data feeds back up. Um, and we also have, uh, again, the Hive is going to be a, a huge piece in its orchestration. Again, a lot of the things are built on Elastic, and the gray log is kind of the focus of that with the, the event collector as well as NX log. And then we kind of have uh, Libra NMS as well doing SMP. Uh, and, and we have, which is not the open source, Part of this, but we do have Rapid Seven. We don't have, uh, we only have Nexpos just for vulnerability management. Again, you see that we have Open Boss up there too. Uh, so Rapid Seven is only doing our critical assets and things like that, um, and doing some passive scanning um, and things like that. So this, this is just an example of an environment um, that we have. There's a lot more in here. This is just some of the components that we're talking about here for orchestration. Do you utilize Bro at all? Uh, we have tested Bro on our network. Uh, and doing some things, uh, we had a uh, we were putting Bro on, on on Raspberry Pis on specific subnets and uh, trying to track lateral movement, things like that, or certain uh, that we might not have as much visibility. Um, and we had some good; it was good, uh, but we just got the data through other other means. Um, and uh, the other thing that we had. Um, uh, we had up is that uh, we had the modern honeypot network to get into things like that. You can actually, it's a bleed through threat stream. It's also free. Um, it does some interesting things. Uh, not as much as obviously Bro, but um, you can run some honeypot stuff on Bro. Um, we also had a problem with forwarding Bro logs uh, and making sense of them uh, in other systems. Um, it was nice to analyze on the system. Uh, we also tried Security Onion uh, places. Uh, and the other thing that was very interesting that we used and I would like to use again was if you ever heard of Selks. Has anyone ever heard of Selks? Has anyone heard of Suricata? So, Sur so Selks is Suricata built on the Elk stack. And it's one package. It's uh, by a company, uh, I believe they're over in either French or Germany, um, and it's, it's good. Um, it does, it's really nice. I recommend trying it out. Um, I know that I want to try it out more than we have before. Uh, we got a lot of good information from it, but it, it's a learning curve because we had to support a full ELK stack. And that's one of the reasons we went with Graylog, because uh, it, it's just the, we got the, the availability or the, the, the um, quickness of the searching um, and responsiveness of the Elastic um, search database with the simplicity of not having to go through a full ELK stack uh, support. Uh, so if you think gray log hard to put, try to put an elk stack in there and forward things to it. That's quite the... I'm sorry, just, I didn't interrupt. Um, no. Alien Vault, does it, it uses Suricata, right? Uh, Alien Vault has the Suricata um, as well as Snort and all kinds of things right. inside of it. It's essentially like a security onion where there's a lot of things are in there. Hmm? Yeah. Um, Suricata is nice. Uh, we use Suricata for some of our, some of our um, IDS systems uh, at our perimeter and outbound egress, um, but it's not built on the Elastic Delk stack or anything like that, it's just basic Suricata. Uh, a lot of people know some of the differences of Suricata and Snort, just for the general audience. How in the processing? Snort's limited to single processor, is that mm -hmm. single threads? Yes. Huh. 
Yes. Yeah, so Circada works a lot, um, works multi-threaded, uh, can do a lot of things, parse it, also has different uh, uh, different rule set uh, scripts, it has a lot of other different things. That's one of the primary differences of Snort. I believe Snort might not have a multiprocessor one now, I'm unaware, but I know that for a long time those were the differentiating factors, and, and that was some of the things why we could run uh, Circada in um, a, a lot larger environment with the lower resources. Okay. Um, again, okay, now we're getting kind of the, uh, uh, do anyone want to take a break real quick? Five minutes, or are you guys good? Five minute break? Good. Sounds good. We'll take five minute break real quick, because we've been going do you uh, need before. Five minute break? I do. I do need <laughs> five minute break. We'll take a five minute break. This is like a three hour thing, so um, don't worry, we got one hour left. How many people having fun? My, my stuff just says four good. hours. Good oh, does it? That's what I'm saying. Oh, it like, starts at two for four ends hours. If she wants to get her money for us. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. How let's do it. We'll be here all day. I'll stay here. <laughs> yes, yes. He can pause all day. You can just start your slides over. Yeah. We'll go get that like, pretend, 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 pretend you didn't realize it and just like give the same training for two hours. Like, I'll teach you Korean. You can do it in Korean.
It hit me really hard at first, but not hard. I said it hit me hard at first. Oh, okay. She's on the one of those sets of eight. Oh, the moon sweepers are over? Oh, those are. I don't know. I I don't know anything about what happened. Or the wireless shirts detached. Yeah, I think I'm wrong. 
now. Yeah. All right. So, so right. since I was trying to like appeal to oh, I didn't get a, like, I didn't get a new audience. audience. You know, that news, you're going to say Right. That's why I didn't know. We had a lot of students last year here, so I was kind of, that's why I started. And I, you know, wasn't sure. Yeah. So I kind of go through three phases that are Josh's upstairs, loosely coupled together. But it's basically like much automated things that you already have, which is like sim tuning and things like that. And then the second phase is scripting and APIs. And I kind of go through to like no, some of the common sense stuff around automation, um, you know, because so I mean, I've seen all some colossal failures where people try to automate stuff that was never documented or anything like yeah. that. So, and so, yeah, yeah, just like, okay, what do we do now? Well, what does the left would say? Well, there's no documentation. What's uh, helpful is through that. I don't even have that in my slides. I wish I would have put it in there. I can't talk about it. We should actually have the journal do it. Um, and we put a lot of them on just like GitHub or the page or some more orchestration scripts. And you've got the engineering team and everyone who's like, this is really powerful. Or you can have a certain thing. And that's fine. But all signs fly well more. Well, this was the hammer of my life. Trust me, for some reason. So it's just like, look, it's in an O'Reilly It's got an animal on the cover, so clearly this is law. And seriously, I mean, that's also part of the reason. It's been published. Thank you. All the tea you spill, and then also we started the sign <laughs> so the All the All the tea. That's what we do. That's what we do. And I thought, I mean, yeah, you were strict for us, but I'd like to me there. I would like to punch her in the face. This is good to me. Earlier, I was very, very close to just like punching the wall until I passed out or something. I would have blamed you. I can't pass it. This is what I've heard. Yeah, it's so I definitely did not time. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. super. I met her a couple of years yeah, yeah. ago. Mm. And right. left the job sitting here. I'm going to get people back in. I'm going to crowl them back. Do you can't forget a selfie. You're like a fat. Do you want to break over? Would you mind? No way. You can get like a more. I'm fine with that. Not just your like head, but like, you know, t shirt. My business partner is a big fan of yours as well. So is it? His name is Eric. Um, he's my business partner, and I just want to rub this in his face. Ready? One, two, three. Yeah. Perfect. Three. <laughs> no, because no, that was important. That was an important. You know, I'll just take his phone here. <laughs> just on his phone. Quick question right. for you before you get started back. Okay. You talked about um, some automated fishing. Officially off. Oh. Phishing tools mm -hmm. that, like, you know, it's kind of like you had a user would be like have a button that mm -hmm. would give that would be able to report back, not just obviously a forwarded email, but something that has header information, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. What, what kind of tools there have you had um, success with? Or? Uh, so, Microsoft actually, are you 365? Yes. So, Microsoft actually has a tool built in now. Uh, you can get the add on. Um, uh, they've always had to report fish, like, kind of built in there, but they actually have a enter an enterprise customization. Uh, add on into 365 now. It's relatively new. Something, um, something more than message trees? Oh, yeah, yeah. You can actually do it in the 365 admin council. Uh, you can actually, it's an add on that you can put on and everyone will have a report to button. Another thing, separate of that, that I recommend uh, is Noble 4. Uh, Noble 4 is uh, kind of Mitnick's uh, security awareness platform phishing uh, system. They have a lot of free tools. One of them is the fish button. It's literally called. You can customize it. And you can literally give it an address to go to, and you can put it, you can upload it, um, or install it as an executable on everyone so it shows up in their Outlook client. Or you can install it as an XML add on uh, within the uh, 365 uh, console so every user will have it inside of either OWA or uh, on the 365 client uh, inside the message. Um, you won't get metrics from that, you'll just get it forwarded. Uh, if you have Noboforce platform of uh, uh, Kevin Mitnick's actual full platform, it will give you all the metrics, and then you can do fishing simulations, and it can do a little nice congratulations and things like that. Noboforce has also a slew of free tools, like uh, Ransom, that will simulate ransomware on your uh, machine in a way of knowing if there's free shares and stuff like that to connect to. 
Uh, and there's like, they have like 24 different random tools. So like, they could do, uh, they can, if you connect into your Active Directory, they can do a scan and we'll see like the top 1,000 passwords and all kinds of like, you know, all kinds of just general tools like that. So, Nova 4 has a slew of free tools that you can use. Um, so, but, um, okay. yeah. So, um, uh, there are a few other um, uh, vendors out there that have, have been offering free fish buttons and things like that. So, I'm sure that there's probably articles out there that kind of compare them all. I started using fish buttons when they were, like, with Nova, through Nova 4, when they first started implementing, like, three years ago. Um, so, and before that, um, at my previous in, uh, employer, we actually custom put in a fish button in the Lotus Note. And that was fun. Because the Lotus script is awesome. Our user requests and IT ticketing system was in there too. It's still there today. So. We're starting back up. Everyone ready? <coughs> Fueled yeah. up? Look at that. We, we, we cut the, we cut the, um, all the other people that don't want to hear anything. So, we are. Now we have, the, we have the meat. We have all the cream. cream. The cream, that's what I was talking about. I know where you're going. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> MSP always has it covered, man. <laughs> um, uh, so let's see. So I can tell Adrian the time it is four ten. Note that. Oh my! Um, so I can tell him. All right. So um, this is a an example of security operation management platform, specific called the Hive. Um, there are links. Uh, the Hive is on GitHub. You can look at that. They also have. It's called the Hive Project. If you want to Google that um, and go to the Hive Project. Uh, Net, um, and you can go through. They have a lot of good uh, information there. Uh, there's also something specific to look at the GitHub. There, you can look up for the Hive Project Training VM, and you can download that, and you can upload that into a uh, virtual box, and you can have the full uh, Hive platform. We'll actually go through that, um, and I'll show you it. it I don't say. I will show you the platform as a straight instance. Um, I don't have a lot of stuff in there. I wish I, I did to have a full workshop. But this is the basic components of the Hive. There are other engines in there. Uh, the Hive is basically made up of uh, a few different components. They kind of call it the three-in-one security um, platform. Uh, it has security operations. It has a security orchestration piece, which is called the Cortex engine. Everywhere you see like a little brain there. That is the Cortex engine. It's essentially working as the management of, of different types of integrations and customizations and scripts that will get loaded through um, the Cortex. Um, and then the Hive itself is essentially a case management system uh, and ticketing system um, that will be able to visualize and track um, whatever alerts and instances come up and then match that data with other enrichment data um, so it will go through specific examples of that. Um, also, the other component that is very um, integrated and compatible with the Hive is something called MISP. Um, other than the other Hive person, does everyone know what? Does anyone else know what MISP is? Yeah, MISP. Okay, good. Uh, our information sharing platform. All right. So uh, the MISP is just like. Um, uh, has a lot of open threat feeds. How many other people are familiar with like OTX, Alien Vault's OTX, right? Um, very somewhat. I want to say it's similar, but you can get OTX feeds. Uh, again, you can get a lot of uh, feeds into the uh, MISP. The nice thing about MISP, and I'm sure other tools have this too, that you can actually create, uh, say, an ASA firewall rule and things like that off of an observable or IOC. Um, or other types of uh, things. Um, uh, how many people have Palo Alto? Does anyone have Palo Alto? Familiar? Do you have MindMeld uh, integrated in that? You just have everything? You got this, you got MindMeld, you got Palo Alto, you got. Well. Huh? What? And that may be covered tomorrow as well. Oh. Yeah, so MindMeld has a lot of good, uh, uh, again, you're paying you know, through a product or things like that, but Palo Alto has MindMeld. I recommend looking. 
uh, mind meld up and how it works and, and the amount of orchestrations and, and things you can get. Because uh, at the end of the day, if you have something come in, there's an observable, it attaches to, attaches to a lot of your enrichment data, all of a sudden you know, okay, I have to implement X rule, and it might not just be block IP address, block domain. It might be a port, uh, certain types of network traffic, and to be able to create those rules on the fly, um, it, again, takes more time. If it takes 20 minutes to you to, to find your IT asset inventory to know what it is, then another 20 minutes to um, uh, understand what to do with that, info, even if you have all the information, and then another 20 or 30 minutes to create a rule that you know is going to work if it's a little complex. Uh, a lot of engines now can right click and kind of create and put that IOC and observable inside of a rule format so you can actually put it into your firewall. So it's not just a basic, like a lot of them might have YAR rules, they might have SNORT rules to, to, to detect, but then how do you prevent that uh, in an ASA, uh, you know, Cisco uh, product or Palo Alto, you know, Force, whatever you have, right? Um, and a lot of uh, uh, items are kind of orchestrating that and making that easier. Um, again, going through through this, again, you have the case templates, you have your cases. Uh, going back to the basics and foundations is uh, if you do, you, does it, the people that had a lot of the automations, you have incident classification, like so you have, you, you have a, a normalization of incidents that come in if it goes to your sim and it kind of escalates into an actual incident. Uh, so those are things that you can recreate and map into something like this to make sure that you're all talking the same language as well as classifying, and when I say classifying the sensitivity of the data too, because again, the malware sharing information platform, if you're in a trusted work group or like we're local government, we might want to share some of our uh, uh, indicators with other local governments. We can actually choose to share what we want if we're classifying all of our data and IOCs off of that. Um, so, and if we want to share something to the general community, uh, we can classify that um, as well, uh, just the overall um, whole case. Uh, so if some, if you guys are familiar with something like the TLPs, traffic light protocols, uh, being white, amber, green, things like that, of just labeling, classifying data, how it's sensitive and how much you want to share that for data sharing, things like that. Um, so you have your case templates, your cases, uh, you're getting your alerts or MISP events in there, so you're constantly getting alerts. Um, MISP is uh, something that would also tie into like your centralized logging infrastructure to see are you getting indicators, um, are you getting IPs and things like that from things of known malicious activity. Um, or once you put something into um, the case, if it's a phishing email or if it's if you're even manually putting something in there, an incident, um, it will automatically go through and analyze um, if there's reported MISP beta or other types of malware feeds and things like that. And then once you go into um, the analyzers um, and observables, um, it has uh, things like the Hive have built in um, uh, APIs and analysis into most uh, known, uh, uh, I would say, analyst uh, uh, use tools. Uh, so when you get an IP address, what do you do with that IP address? Let's go through, through some of that. What do you guys do? You get an IP address, something's bad, or domain, what do you do for What's the first thing you guys do? There's no right or wrong answer here. Check its reputation. Huh? Check its reputation. So what do you use, what do people use to check reputation? BT. Hmm? BT. BT? Firestorm. Okay. Anyone else do something else? Right? Something like that, though? Combination IP. Huh? Abuse IP. Abuse IP. Good. Okay. Talos. Anvos. Talos, right. The main tool, who is, right? Just basically. Shodan. Shodan. You know. Good, right? Um, anything else, right? Or any type of URL scanner, right, out there, right? Or, or maybe your product's built in, right? If you have uh, Cisco, it might be going through, again, Talos, as we said. Uh, Palo Alto might be checking my meld. Uh, or just your products um, blocking, right? Um, so again, uh, those those analyzers all connect to those systems. Um, can you imagine? Do you all go out there manually and check those things usually? I mean, um, yeah, no, you guys well. got that uh, or straight through Splunk maybe or something. Right, so uh, a lot of sims automatically check against things like OTX um, and maybe other types of feeds. Maybe they pay for feeds, right? Um, so again, um, getting those things and tying them into, did anybody have like a malware uh, sandbox that they used internally? Anyone malware sandboxing? 
Now, what do you malware sandboxing? Well, the services we use. Yeah, so we have a sandbox. What do you? I use uh, just sandbox or app.any.run. Okay, so you can so you when you're analyzing something, it's in like a sandbox, like uh, IE Explorer or something, or or uh, whatever your PDF or something you're opening in a sandbox. Okay, what about? Modifier. Hmm. PA modifier. Modifier. Okay. But to, to add to that, uh, if you're a member of the Infocard, they mm -hmm. have a nice mm -hmm. sandbox. Too. Yep. Yeah. So. It's Guardian, uh, I think. Huh? Guardian. I think it's called. Guardian. Yeah. Um. Uh, Investigator. Our investigator, okay. Maybe. Mm -hmm. So if you're in local government, you have access to uh, something similar to InfraGuards uh, uh, through uh, the, the MSI SAC, and it's a um, generally just a, an analyzer. I think it's through threat stream, right? So, uh, also, if you use like Anomaly or some type of other thing, they can use a sandbox. If you ever, anyone ever heard of Kaku sandboxing, mm -hmm. right? It's an internal sandbox. Again, a lot of those things, um, if you know that someone's got a malicious PDF or things like that, and they reported the email uh, through this system, um, instead of just having it and be able to do all that analysis, um, and we'll walk through this um, uh, ad hoc, you can actually tie into some of the APIs. Buyer's total, you're, uh, you can actually get an API that a lot of your systems, a lot of systems already have that, you can connect in there. Um, uh, I don't know if InfraGuard probably doesn't have an API with it, but I know that other platforms like the ones that we have for local government, we have an API key that we can just put in and automatically do it and send the report back. And you also be able to see the report in the, in the system itself. Um, so those are some of the things that you want to do when you get, and then, and then the analysis report will already be there. So all those things can happen right when a user is reporting something and or an alert is, is kicked off. So you have all that data already enriched and you have all that data already there for you to analyze, and you can already understand if, you know what, if I get a domain that came through as a phishing email, and the domain went through, but I know that my, my web filter or proxy is already blocking that, I'm probably going to put that on the lower priority list um, to look at than something that isn't being blocked by a web filter or any type of other firewall or defense in depth machine or, 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 or uh, system. Make sense? Fun stuff? All right, so um, uh, just to also uh, mention just a few other um, uh, operation management and, and orchestration tools that are out there to look up. And the, again, they'll be in the notes that when I release this. What I'll probably do is just so you guys know, uh, I'll probably contact the organizers and have them send out to everyone that's registered. Um, and, and probably it'll probably just be on their website or something like that, all that information uh, that I have here. Uh, but the other things to look up are something, uh, CrowdStrike has the Falcon Orchestrator. Has anyone had any experience with that? It's, it's an open source, CrowdStrike actually open source that. Obviously it's somewhat, uh, um, let's say somewhat limited, obviously they want you to use their full tool. Anyone heard of that, use that? But it's interesting to look at if you're getting into orchestration, um, specifically security orchestration. Uh, uh, Homeland Security actually has a tool called WalkOff. Never heard of that. Very interesting orchestration tool. Um, so I recommend if you haven't, uh, I think it's not even the Information Assurance Division anymore, but it's literally um, the NSA's GitHub. How many people have looked through the NSA's GitHub? Not their GitHub of everything, but our GitHub. <laughs> their GitHub. They have a lot of PowerShell tools, a lot of. How many people are familiar with Stigs? Stigs, right? So, I mean, you must, if you get the Stigs, you're getting that from a DOD in some form, right? Uh, NSA has a very large uh, repository in their GitHub of uh, security policies, Windows GPOs, um, all kinds of things that are, are right for the picking to be able to uh, use, as well as orchestration uh, things and tools and stuff like that. Definitely something to uh, look at. Um, so, um, death to email alerts, right? Um, this is additional integrations. Um, again, this is something called uh, Samsung. Are you guys using, where's the Hive guy, right? Hive? Uh, did he leave? Oh, back at now. Oh, he switched up. Yeah, I got moved. I'm sorry. I was, I was like, you didn't get huh? okay. All right, so uh, are you guys using the Synapse tool there? It's newer, and a newer Hive instance uh, within the past, I think, three or four months. Uh, it's uh, 1.1 right now. 
they actually fully connect into Exchange. They have an Exchange connector now, uh, so they can read a lot emails a lot better than before. It was a Python parser, which worked fine. Um, but now it's, uh, and I still believe it's built in Python, but again, um, uh, and, and the Hive uh, is built on a Python module, so you, anything is extensible with the Python. Uh, they have actually everything called, it's literally called um, the Hive for Pi. Um, so uh, they have an entire documentation on that for the Hive connector, so everything is going through essentially a like service-oriented architecture and, and, and main system. So you can, um, uh, you're able to extend the functionality tremendously because it's using one, one, one centralized um, uh, connector there. Is the, synapse, is the synapse like Cortex as far as a so it's, integration, integration part? So it's interesting. Um, it's, it's, it connects outside of the Cortex right into, so the Cortex has um, a lot of, uh, is essentially the analysis engine, um, and then the Hive also has like a, a extension that's called for the, the 4Pi part of it, and it all goes back into uh, the Hive and the Cortex, but it's kind of like they built off the extension module something a little separate. Uh, so you can build in separate Cortex engines, uh, but you can also then build in um, uh, feeds through the actual Hive. So everything gets throw, thrown in through the Cortex engine. It's just the input um, from it. Um, so again, uh, they have built in, uh, again, so like when you go back to here, this is more in the specifics of this area right here. So then once everything goes in, it's still coming down through here through the Cortex engines. Um, before, um, there were Cortex engines directly. There are also Cortex engines to analyze and parse the email. Now what is happening, though, it's happening on this side. Uh, so it's actually getting it normalized in the data so it can do more with it. So Synapse is not just an alert, but it, it, can, it can analyze the email? Yeah, it, it's essentially a... I'm not an architectural software engineer, uh, but it's like a middleware parser. We'll go through it. I'll actually go through the email uh, analyzer in more detail. Um, so, uh, and then the Hive uh, recently also has a built-in native um, uh, integration with IBM uh, QAR. Um, again, that's native. You can build everything in custom as well. Um, so, I think they already have one for Splunk. That's one people out there. Um, so, I think that was the first one. Uh, so, we have browsing time. So, I'm going to try to do this since I am limited here. Um, and actually browse through some stuff. So, I'm going to get out, outside of this. Um, it's going to be interesting how I'm going to do this. How far I can get. I can kind of get it up right here. Can hold it. Okay. All right. Oh, it's like still presenting. Okay, uh, so I'm going to go through some of the stuff that I did talk about. Again, this is the Hive Docs. Uh, uh, it's the documentation within the Hive project. Um, and uh, I will increase this a little. Um, so going through here, um, I'm, I'm just going to kind of go through some of this training material. They have an OVA uh, for the training module. Um, you can download this um, and go through. Again, it includes on the top of the Hive, the Cortex engine, again, the, the API kind of connector engine, which is the Hive for Pi, uh, the Cortex for Pi, which again is a, a, a different Pi connector for that, um, and uh, any available Cortex an analyzer there. So um, that is what you get. Um, there are also more, let's see, go through so I can get all this uh, 
Um, this is kind of the architecture here um, of the hive specifically. Um, so it is also built on Elasticsearch, um, which is nice. Uh, the front front end there um, has a bunch of REST APIs. The Cord Cortex engine is there where it goes through the different types of analyzers and responders. Uh, responders are the things that just come back essentially uh, with information um, uh, externally. Um, uh, so that is the, I went through the workflow architecture already. Um, and that is, uh, that is what the hive does look like. We'll go more in, in depth into that. Um, and yeah, so just uh, wanted to kind of talk about how the ports of the engine and uh, plays with that um, and everything. So we're going to go through and go back the training. Um, again, you can get it. Um, you go through and download this. Um, uh, there's previous versions, beta versions, and it lets you know how to kind of go through and use it. Um, and there's a lot of documentation here. That's all I'm going to go through on that. Uh, the thing that I want to go through, though, is the Synapse use case. So um, this is a Synapse use case here. Uh, it's a demo. Um, I'm not going to go through and read this word for word, but essentially, um, uh, someone has clicked, um, or someone has gotten um, uh, an email and actually forwarded it on to the CERT team. However that is, um, again, if that's through, um, again, in here it's saying that she attached it as an MSG file. How many of you will try to explain users in the training to attach, attach emails and send it to the, how, how, how fun is that? I mean, forward as an email. Forward as an email. Attachment, yeah. They never get it. The right, Microsoft changing Outlook, how you do it every... Yeah, every single time. The question always is, what can I just forward? Yeah. Uh, and that's why buttons are amazing. Find yeah. a button, you know, find <laughs> a button. Take one thing that's not even secure orchestration really related other than the source, find an email reporting button and use it. Um, it changes the life of, like, training and awareness. And you will get a lot of people clicking that button. We have people that will click that button on every spam email. When I say spam email, I mean more like like marketing email they get, junk email. Uh, we'll get every morning. We'll get thirty from the same person. At the end of the day, we, we call them up and say, "Hey, you know, report this, this, and this." And it's at least they're reporting it to us, right? We get we get people that will forward they'll go get a notification that. Hey, just so you know, we just put this email on spam because it's spam. It's not an actual email. They'll forward that to us because they think that that email specifically that they got no that notice is spam. And then yeah, then they'll, they'll take it out of spam folder and actually read the email yeah. because we got to the point where when certain departments send out communications and they don't say put a uh, signature or they just it's just weird. We'll get a whole thing, and we, we have to watch out our orchestration piece so we don't automatically start blocking internal communication. Um, and that's just a cultural thing that we have. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, so you get the email uh, forwards to the CERT team. Look at that. It says, Dear CERT team. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, it might not be nothing, just in case. <laughs> it's nice. Um, again, uh, there's a, a so now that, um, and this is interesting because we didn't do this at first with orchestration. I've now been learning this through the Synapse. Um, I didn't really think about this because we just had it automatically go to the Hive. Um, and just it, the email inbox is just like a, just a transport mechanism, really. Uh, this is kind of interesting, though. Uh, so what, uh, what the Hive is, is, is suggesting in this use case is uh, setting up custom categories uh, in the shared Outlook box for your CERT team um, on, uh, for every one of your users uh, or your, your, uh, your uh, security SOC analysts. Once it categorizes as that, um, it will automatically create the case. <coughs> it will say that that person, that's essentially setting that that person is working on it. And um, so then, and what they do is they actually have a manual intervention that they drop the folder um, into a specific file, folder name called the Hive. So the Hive is constantly looking at the folder name. Some people, as this is using a certain name, we actually have a spam at our domain dot, uh, uh, 
just add our domain. So that's what the spam's going. It doesn't go to our cert team. The other stuff goes to the cert team. Some people, everything goes to their cert team. So it depends on how. You, so that's why ours is the transport mechanism. Because all it's all spam going there. The only thing is going there is corrected spam um, through that system. Nothing else. Uh, but this prevents potentially if you had one IT security at or if you had IR at, you just had every user security at, uh, you could actually uh, control so not everything that people will send you is going to the hive or going to your orchestration platform. Put a folder and you put logic around that. Um, so again, they're, they're drag and drop into the hive as you can see there. Um, and uh, uh, you can see it on red in the high folder. Okay, it goes down. So now there's a Git request uh, going to uh, 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 Synapse, um, and it goes in and it goes through the API. And um, again, the um, uh, the specific um, URL that that system was coming from, as you saw, was from stargazer.org. So uh, Synapse actually does the, FTQ, uh, the FQDN and sends it um, toward, uh, let's see, I'm trying to follow this. Uh, we are not using Synapse yet. I'm actually looking forward to it. Uh, it seems like it has a lot better core workflow engine than the basic email parser that's in the 4.5. Uh, so again, Automaker creates a task and assigns it to EE, uh, which was the person that actually categorized it. Um, it gets uh, created as a strange email from and that person. Again, it's all built in however you want this, um, the workflow to work, uh, go through. Um, some of these things are built into the Hive directly, like, as I said, the TLPs. You want everything coming from a specific um, uh, income of having a specific TLP, and then you can lower or higher that as you go through manually in the process. So you'll see the case created. Um, again, um, inside the hive, you actually create tasks for each case. Um, so again, uh, the, uh, Synapse created the, the name communication. Um, and so it will actually connect the, the full, the full email body to the cert team there, attachment handling, there's an attachment there. These are what we're calling, talking about the observables there. So that's an order form, the PDF. Um, if you drag anything into a Hive case, it'll automatically create it and put the file name there. And if you have observables or you have systems connecting the virus total, automatically run that through virus total scan and get you the summary of the results. Um, and let's see if that comes through here. Um, again, that's going through this is the summary of the email message here. Uh, it automatically has the headers in there. Um, so when uh, you reply back, to, and it also CCs the team, so when you're adding any information inside the hive, uh, this isn't showing a lot of the information, so I, sorry, I, I kind of, I knew this just came out, so I was going to use this for this class, but um, uh, so inside the hive, uh, when the person put in communication, the task communication, it actually um, will automatically email that person something using the exchange connector. So, uh, like we have inside of the cert, um, uh, inside of our cert thing, or inside of our cert email, we had it set up where it automatically notified the user that we're working on the case. That's just a cultural thing. How many people have that set up, like auto reply or something like that? Uh, what you can do is you can essentially get auto replies as you put and work in the case information to update the user if you want to do that. Um, I'm hoping this gets into. I'm gonna have to just go into the hive directly. This is going through configuration. Okay, that's not showing what I wanted to show. Um, what I wanted to show is it takes the PDF, it runs it through virus code, it comes back, it, it creates the rules with the miss. Um, I'll see if I can get some of uh, that up. Let's see. All right. Oh, I don't have any. 
Um, all right, so we'll go through and, and just go through some of these things, um, and then we'll get to the, one of the exercises that I have built up. So all the way to the top here, you can see the summary of all the, the analyzers. Um, can everyone read this? I was hoping that that use case in the Synapse thing. So that's uh, note to self, don't use uh, walkthrough documentation that you don't know what it really says. Um, <laughs> so here are a lot of the free analyzers that's built into the hive that you can attach through the Cortex engine. Again, a lot of people mentioned uh, abuse, abuse finder, um, a Cuckoo Sandbox. If you have a Cuckoo Sandbox running, obviously you have to have some of these systems running. Um, uh, D-Shield, um, email parser, again, that was what we'll take in and actually uh, parse through the email for IP addresses and, observe, and other types of domains and information. Um, uh, uh, Google Safe browsing information. Um, I'm not going to go through every one of these. The missed, missed warning lists. Um, OTX query, you can query your OTX uh, API. Uh, you go through um, um, threat crowd. Uh, URL scan.io, which is actually very interesting if you guys haven't used that before. Uh, one of my engineers found that, like, I think maybe a year ago. It's very interesting if you use it before. It uh, gives you a screenshot. Uh, a lot of, there are other ones that do it too, but it does it very well. Uh, it gives you a screenshot of the website and things like that. Um, and you can kind of like crowdsource what other people are reporting, things like that. Um, Again, uh, analyze for requesting special access. That means that you need uh, some type of account or specific, uh, maybe small paid uh, API access. Things, uh, obviously they have IBM X Force, you probably need that. Um, there's Shodan is essentially the one I wanted to um, connect here. Uh, every, I believe, Black Friday, Christmas time and holiday, Shodan has a, um, a a deal where you can get like a five dollar lifetime deal in API to Shodan. I recommend getting that. How many people have a Shodan account, like an actual account? Right. Have you got it during the five dollar window? Of course. Yeah. Well, of course, <laughs> right? Um, so, if you don't know that, um, uh, they have a. F I'm, I'm sure it seems like it just runs year round, but it's always randomly. Watch the Twitter. It'll be a five dollar. Uh, deal. I don't even know what it is normally. It's oh, probably like 50 bucks. bucks. It's, huh? it's 50, 50 bucks. bucks. Okay, yeah. So It's always on Black Friday. It's always on Black Friday. It's always on like various holidays and things I want to decide to. So recommend doing that and, and connecting that up. Um, uh, just general uh, general thing is that uh, how many you show in on a regular basis? Uh, when you're doing that, what are you actually putting in to, to um, look up? I, I, that's kind of a weird question, but uh, usually the IP address or domains, you put anything else in there? Yeah. Yeah. Usually it's, it's huh? Not usually it's IP address for me. Mm -hmm. You usually, can actually... Um, location sometimes. Yeah, location. location. You can put your ASN in there. Right. As well, if you guys didn't know that. Um, which is your whole, essentially, IP block, potentially. It's see everything in there instead of putting an IP range or whatever. You can monitor just for your ASN. It's a lot easier to do. Uh, they also just recently put Docker uh, instances that they're scanning up there. So that was just recent. Uh, I think there was like a thousand on the first day or something they put up there. I don't know how recent it was. I think it might be a month old. I only read Twitter every couple, couple times a year, but uh, that's something new that they had up there. Um, again, subscription based. Um, if you have domain tool subscriptions, uh, other types of things, emerging threats to subscriptions. Uh, Nessus subscriptions, so again, virus total, you can actually have a subscription to it as well um, to get the kind of the special virus total feeds um, that they have. Uh, recorded Future is also on there. Um, has anyone used something, stuff like Recorded Future or any of the threat, uh, threat intelligence systems? Other than, you know, people said they use MISP. Do you guys use any other type of threat intel? Yeah. FSI, the ISACs? Yeah. Okay. Do they use Ultra Edge still or no? What's that? Do you still use Ultra Edge? No. Okay, yeah. So, again, those are the analyzed specific. We're not going to go too much through this again. This is not really like a full working uh, workshop here. Um, other things that I wanted to go over um, that I had up were. I'm on the Hive instance. 
Uh, okay, this is, I didn't log me out, so I'll interact connection right now. But this is, again, this is the training version of the, uh, it can literally just be uploading the OVA and it's up. Passwords are the Hive and the Hive1234, change those when you get in there. But this is essentially what you're going to see. Um, I, um, I tried, when I had this up, uh, phone in there, I didn't want to, uh, fully set up and, and start putting observables. You actually do have to connect the, the Cortex analyzers and the APIs and stuff for it to start working. Um, so this is just an example of like a domain, uh, photoscape.ch, things like that. Um, and you can start going through the waiting tasks, the alerts. Um, this is kind of like the nice thing that it, it creates. And, and, and if you have a full SIM platform that does this, um, um, you know, it does all the open cases, case by status, the tags, resolutions. Uh, we as a security department do more things than to just go to our SIM. Uh, we fulfill web usage reports, we fulfill uh, forensic reports, we fulfill uh, vulnerability um, analysis and remediation, just random investigations that come, uh, rogue things in the network. All those th things are in our, our operations management. And we don't want to put those in our IT ticketing system because the IT ticketing system isn't built to have all those things and to upload malicious PDFs and start analyzing them and, and hold them. Because previously we used to just do that and just have those malicious PDFs on like a hard drive um, on one of our analyst machines and that's not much better. Um, so how, how do other people here, uh, do you guys have one kind of, you use your IT ticketing system for all stuff, security operations, you use your own, you use a combination of all your tools have their own ticketing system? Clear combination, investigation one, Right. That's what we're kind of in right now is that some of our investigations can't be in the ticketing system even if we had it built in because it's, it can't, right? Um, uh, and uh, uh, this is kind of one of the tools that we can build in. And even if you don't have a Cortex engine or an analyzer observer attached to everything, it's still a central place to put it in and start tracking the case management. Well, we've, we haven't done this. We haven't even really researched this, but it's kind of an ID idea of uh, our, our IT team, they want to have centralized metrics, uh, so we're talking about creating an API just to create that there was a case, you know, and the case ID is this, and maybe put certain metadata around it, but not nothing more than that. So at least the metrics can be, and, and the IT team, service desk team and stuff can be happy that we have our metrics there, and we're doing something, and we're not in our own black box doing our own ticketing. Um, so we looked at interoperating like that. Has anyone else looked at that, like, does your, does your Splunk has, like, uh, a ticketing system kind of built into it, right? Does that interoperate it with your IT ticketing system? Well, we all full of separate? Not really. We, we use one of but it'd be nice. Mm. I've never seen a ticketing system work well with Splunk. Really? Yeah. From an MSP, MSSP? Or, or anything, really. I mean, it's just a hard... Yeah. Can I get that in an email so I can send that to my boss? <laughs> 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 they have an app for it. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> How about the, the Hive user in the back here? What Have you guys been building this out? You, this looks familiar, I assume, in some oh, yeah. form. Um, what Cortex analyzers are you really using, or are you kind of just playing with it? Uh, we use DNS, we use um, uh, DHCP, we use VirusTotal, um, we use email, but not the Synapse um, through the for exchange, we mm -hmm. uh, upload the message and do the, uh, do the analysis on it there. Mm -hmm. um, those are the primary ones right now. Okay. But yeah. again, we're, we're still in the phase yeah. of building. Right. So um, as you can see, this is the case, but then there's the Cortex engine here um, where you can have job histories and, and, and like how things are being pushed off and you can manually analyze things. Uh, you can put certain types of rules around automatic analysis tied to certain cases and things like that. You can essentially build the whole workflow engine in here. Um, I'm not going to go through building an entire one or anything like that because it's probably, because this is a just random train OVA, you probably won't be able to talk outbound or do anything. But uh, um, that's essentially what you're putting up. It's, a lot of, it, it, it's very simple once you put your mind to it and you kind of focus on it. And it helps a lot to put everything in one place. So. Um, that is some of the just, just basic demo stuff I want to, to, to be able to show you guys um, as I go back to some of the slides here.
No, we've done surfing. Um, so again, that was uh, uh, the uh, what we just looked at. That's kind of it built out a little more a screenshot. Um, you can see that there's like uh, a lot of stuff from the MISP is in there. Um, again, that's like open source intelligence, things coming in. You guys, someone mentioned InfraGuard, right? Well, when you get the flat, how many other people are InfraGuard members? You get flash messages, PIVs or whatever. When you when they have IP or IOCs or observables, what do you do with those? Start around the if they the network. Did you just like copy them from that PDF file and just throw them into like the thing, right? Do you guys do anything with them? I, I, a lot of places don't do anything with them. We just kind of look at them. Put them with the rest of the fire. <laughs> right. right. Um, so a lot of you can actually go in and um, uh, do a lot of parsing and stuff. So you can just upload those and parse it out, and it can automatically go through and enrich that data. Uh, and that doesn't seem like it's a big thing. But that's a. It is a big thing where you can just drag and drop and go through and see. As long as the parser engine works right, you can see if there's any hits. You don't have to really worry about it, right? Um, it's really nice, especially if you get. Uh, we get intelligence from what was in CSV format of like malicious IPs and stuff from certain ISACs and things like that. And it's just, it just gets to become a lot of data, even if it's easy to do. Just copy and paste data all day into a into your centralized log it could be a two or three FTEs uh, just to start doing that, right? Uh, so I ignore that because we took a break later. Um, so, but that's a white hat eating eating down some black hat there. So. <laughs> um, so exercise time. Are you guys ready to exercise? Tabletop time. Are you guys done for the day? On the table. Yeah, exercise on the table. All right. Um, uh, if, you, if you've done exercise before, this is just general. This is for the 15-minute tabletops. I just start with this. Um, again, this is. Uh, just generally, the the format and, and framework of a, of a quick tabletop exercise. Um, it's uh, again snare on the meaning learning, learning parts uh, points. Um, uh, don't make the snare too large. Essentially, uh, read it out loud to the whole group. We'll do that, but that's you know in a, in a meeting setting. Um, and then uh, use the discussion page. There's like a separate discussion page, which is kind of like an index page, but it's really just like what to discuss around. Those are things you want to focus on because you know those are going to be issues potentially. Um, and then uh, always take notes and uh, of any potential gaps and identify any areas of automation that could help in the security operations. Um, again, there's do's and don'ts. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We're going to go right into the scenario. All right. Ready for scenario time? Mm. All right, so while reviewing access logs, an alert was raised due to an employee attempting to gain access to a network share file. So folder contains sensitive data, which requires a specific security group membership. Uh, under Upon further inspection, you realize that the other folders that count has been accessing that contain sensitive data do not have any restricted permissions but domain users. Um, web filtering logs also show large uploads to an unknown cloud storage environment that wasn't uh, used by the enterprise. Again, um, I'm going to go right into uh, essentially the result of it. Um, and uh, that's how these the quicker tabletops kind of work, is that uh, it ended up being um, an email phishing cam campaign. That's, that's I need to work on that. Uh, that was uh, missed, resulting in credential compromise. Um, uh, the credentials are also used for ADFS and the SSO to VPN, resulting in a remote compromise of the user's machine and valid credentials, then resulting in data exfiltration. Um, how many people think that is a realistic possibility to happen in an environment, right? Agreeable? Yes. Not mm -hmm. too crazy of an attack chain, right? Uh, how many people are, are know the entire folder permissions in their entire environment and monitor that, right? Um, how many people know and scan exactly how many folder environment or folders can be accessed and the NTFS permissions through just domain users? Right, it's, uh, it's something, it's it is, right? 
Um, so this could definitely happen. Um, how many people, when you're monitoring what you're monitoring, monitor when someone's trying to act, be accessing or, or try to add a group over and over and over again, even if it's unsuccessful? Would, what in the financial world, yeah, I would monitor that. You would monitor that, even if it was unsuccessful? Yeah, actually, that's what I would be looking for the unsuccessful. Okay, all right, anyone else? I mean, the sim, our sim would pick that up. An unsuccessful attempt, not just successful? Yeah, as long as the okay. auditing's turned off. Yeah. Would you know that that group, that folder, actually had sensitive data in it or not? Not specifically. Not specifically, right. Yeah. And that's what was like a folder that we would know. I mean, if it's something that's HR or something. Then right, you would assume. Right, you would exactly. Be, and that's, that's uh, again, so do you have folders that you know have sensitive data, or at least supposed to have sensitive data? Obviously, people can put things in. I get into the whole DLP monitor and stuff. I'm just saying, like, you have policy procedures that you know that all these folders are specifically set for sensitive data. And you have probably, say, hard coded static monitoring on those. Right. That, in the financial world, uh, we would only turn on auditing for areas where that right. information is sensitive. Correct. Right, because it's a lot of data to analyze. Right. We use a tool called Veronis, I think, for our shares. Oh, you got that's that money too, man. <laughs> Healthcare, man. Um, that's we. Veronis does a very good job. Yeah, we use that to ma uh, manage AD group ads and unstructured data. Yep, that's exactly what. So you would see, throw, it would easily see something like that. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, if you haven't looked at Veronis, it's a very interesting tool. It's very expensive. Um, Netrix. Netrix. Mm -hmm. Netrix is another uh, kind of AD purchase tool and things like that. Um, the other thing that you can use is one of those events. <laughs> yeah, that's what those systems are using. They're just using, work. they're just using very well. Yeah. Sometimes you gotta put the gloves on and yeah. type away. Nice. Sift through right. it manually if you want to. Yeah, or or automate it. So, again, uh, the thing to take here when you're looking at automation and what to automate is looking at the the things in the bottom here. I don't know if you can see because my laptop's kind of right here. Is the time to fully investigate? How long would it take you to fully investigate this? I kind of have general numbers in here for a small business that has one or two security guys and maybe an IT department of a few dozen or something, but what do you think? Throw numbers out. What do you think? Don't sell yourself short. <laughs> so yeah, so this is like one FT, just saying, oh, okay, I got one alert, I'll look into this. Oh, now I got another alert. Because think about your alert fatigue, too, over this, right? Yeah, I mean, or you, that's why I said eight hours over three business days. Right. You'll get probably six different spam emails in between getting an alert like this and all that stuff. So, How long? Anyone want to be the first one? To... No? No one? No idea? How long would it be individually for you to realize in your environment? No? 30 minutes? An hour? It takes 30 minutes for a phishing email. We know that. We talked about that, right? Uh, potentially. You know, the Veronis guys are there like, what happened? It just blocked it. We didn't. It you was know, milliseconds there. But, uh... In this scenario, are we using this guy's product here that lets us know everything? <laughs> no, <yeah. laughs> that's the question here. This is just you and your current environment um, with your skill set. So again, think about that. Uh, not only are you looking at the, the group membership, but you're also looking at the web proxy logs that, are, that were outbound. Also, the compromising uh, the VPN logins that were probably anomaly, anomalous, and then the phishing email that came in that actually uh, compromising, because again, that, it was using valid credentials. Now we also trying to determine what was taken and if... Uh, no, this is just fully investigate um, to, to what this is, that you know that that happened, let alone whatever the files were, right? And then how many people would have to be involved? So I have a kind of number here, like in your environment, you know, if we have segmented access uh, or certain things, how many people do you have to contact your firewall team, this, this, and that? How many people are actually involved who do you tell your manager? Does your manager tell your manager? Uh, is there, you know, how far up does this go? Um, you know, 15 people, and then uh, when did it actually happen, right? This is potentially manual analysis, right? Um, so I'm, I'm just putting this in there as two months, but it's just, again, arbitrary numbers. These are the numbers when you think about when you're looking at scenarios like this uh, to see how would you detect this in your environment.
So it's something to think about. I mean, I think you, you definitely have to look at like the activity level, in that, mm -hmm. right? So I mean, a user, if we're looking at this as a, as a, fish, a successful phishing email credential harvest, then I mean, even uh, I think even your most sophisticated tools, if an indicator, uh, I mean, if the user that got that that those credentials signs in during normal business hours during the day. I mean, they already got the credits, they're not brute force, so I'm not getting one user ID 500 times in mm -hmm. 10 minutes trying to log in. I mean, it, it depends on, I guess, when, when you initially pick it up. Right, so uh, I'll go right into the discussion points. So every every 15 minute tabletop exercise um, that, that we do actually goes back to the NIST functions, um, and you could probably put them all on there in some portion, but. I put a few examples, but we always try to put the NIST functions on there, and then we also have the discussion points here. So again, how was it detected initially? You know, manual analysis or did the, the the spam? Again, you were talking about what key items identified the RCA, right? Files being accessed, log on activity, web activity. Again, this is valid credentials, so it's not a fail. There's nothing would be it. now. Maybe there was anomalous RDP traffic. Right? It was, or maybe it was anomalous login through the VPN. Maybe it was, maybe you know that that user only VPNs in, like why are they VPNing in the middle of the day? They're also logged in, right? Do, do you have anything that checks, in any of your products that checks that a user is logged in internally and VPN at the same time? Just something to think about. The baseline per user. Uh, yeah, I mean, that gets that extensive, but even just that, do you have something that just checks again against, even if you have a baseline of when they check, they log in, but just, is someone also logged into uh, from an internal machine and VPNed in from the outside at the same time? What if they're VPNed in from the inside? Hopefully the customer Right, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. You, depending on your network well, architecture, you could, you could hairpin <laughs> out, right? You could hairpin back in. Uh, but yeah, so it's just like, do you have something that detects that, assuming that it was an uh, uh, interesting thing for the MSSP, right? I mean, you, do you have an alert? Kind of looks at a correlation, maybe? Maybe you do, I don't know. Depends on the service that right, the yeah. purchased. And how, um, Anything? Is that? We do, yeah. You have? Mm -hmm. That looks out. Okay, all right. Is that would be something that you guys probably might not would think about? I don't know. I'm just discussion. I don't have any of this right now. I'm just off the top of my head going through some of these, right? Um, you know, what else could you automate? Again, when even looking at you're just looking at instant alerting, alerting and correlation. Then what could you automate? How did you know uh, you would go through and see um, who was involved in the overall investigation, who was notified? So, for instance, once something maybe escalates to a point where you know it's an incident in the hive or whatever you're in, uh, do you put, um, uh, okay, now an alert has to go out to upper management, right? Does the email go to upper management and says, hey, we have an issue. This might, it's not a critical issue yet, but something we're investigating, we'll let you know. We might need to get more staffing or involve maybe additional forensic services. Um, where would you, or at what point would you, work into getting in contact with the account holder and saying, hey, we, we noticed some unusual activity. Because that, and that, that we is, fall into that sometimes, we immediately jump to the conclusion that there's nefarious activity and then we mm -hmm. talk to the account holder and there's a use case that we didn't. Right. Maybe they left their, um, you know, their VPN session open at home because they have two machines and, you know, then maybe... You know, they needed to access a sensitive document because the ticketing system wasn't working or ticketing was, their ticket wasn't getting uh, 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 completed and they were trying to access this group and they couldn't and then all of a sudden, um, you know, they had access to a different group that had to fully domain user um, access and then all of a sudden they were just copying stuff up because maybe they had to work from home because, or work from different location because they were traveling to a different location and they were using some cloud storage that was shadow IT, right? Um, so it could be a use case, right? So when do you when do you call the user? Do you have, that would go back down to your policies and procedures of do you have a policy around when you do make direct user contact when you have security event information? Do you guys have any guidelines around that? Anyone? Financial, we did. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 
with our incident response policy. Uh, if an account was acting uh, irregularly, you just shut it down. Then you inform the user, call the user, call you. Uh, yeah. But you, you stop the account from going. There you go. So, um, so very interesting. Um, again, and, and can you workflow this? So once you get an incident like this into like something like the hybrid orchestration, does it automatically email or contact the user or put a task in for the SOC analyst to manually call the user and then put in the notes what they expect, right? There's all those kind of automations that can help you essentially go through your run books. Like, do you have a run book or a playbook around how you do your incident response um, processes or uh, any other procedural things you have, and you can just recreate those run books. Even if the tasks aren't automated, at least the tasks are there, created, and then you put in the data manually. And that's still getting into the, the foundational models of somewhat security um, automation orchestration and essentially walking an analyst through if they put in a uh, phishing campaign. Now these are all the things that either the system's going to do automatically for you and enrich that data, and this is what you should do and when you should do it. This is when you call the user, this is not when you call the user, this is when you call maybe the user's manager, um, and things like that. What do you think would cut down the total time in, in something like this? Go back to the, uh, the original scenario. What would be the most time-extensive thing here in your guys' environment, other than the Toronto's people? Um, well, the ability to detect right away. Right away? It would have cut down if the user would have notified somebody, hey, this could have potentially been right suspicious. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The report to the one thing you get from this. Get a report by right? Or if they would have maybe forwarded the email correctly in the, at the end of the attachment. Right. Anything else? That's assuming the user realized what they did or what it was. Mm -hmm. Does your security team know the folder permissions and how those should be assigned throughout your entire environment? Or is that something the engineering infrastructure knows? Just a random Windows admin somewhere. Rogue <laughs> Windows admin under the desk? Mm -hmm. Three people. <clears throat> no? Yes? Well, in, in terms of the automation, ideally ahead of time, you would have a, a regular scan looking for open network shares. You would have an alert that, that says, hey, there's, uh, there's a large amount of data egress going to going anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's a recognized file right. service or not. So if, if those are if, if those are things that an analyst saw in the activity and that, that you could figure out that, that that is something that is atypical, then put a monitor on that alert mm -hmm. so you're notified of that is. Right. Does anyone here have something that uh, analyzes exfil of data? Absolutely. Exfil of data? Uh, you're like a web proxy or something or a proxy monitoring or? So, so if, you, if I upload 50 gigs to a random Dropbox? Oh, yeah, I mean, so we could have it. Alert? Uh, yeah, yeah. The NetFlow data yeah. or something? Yeah. NetFlow? Yeah, that's from all firewalls. The firewalls? Endpoint DLP. Endpoint DLP. Casby. Casby, yeah. Casby would be a prime. I know that's what I would do is I, what we have capable is a Casby solution. That would, uh, well, I didn't say the Casby, the uh, Casby Solutions product has a shadow IT component. FUFT. Hmm? FUFT. That's what we do. Oh, okay. FUFT. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? No one else detect that? Egresses? Upload all? So work, yeah. I mean, we, we, we detect uh, encrypted uploads. Um, actually detected and blocked it at our, uh, at our mm -hmm. board. Um, we also, I think I say actually block all um, file storage. All file storage? It, as it's categorized by a product? Yes. yes. So a new file storage yeah, or something? Obviously, yeah. Uh, so obviously, obviously we also get new. New. Yep. Someone that has like own cloud set up on their home. Right. And then, just, then you're not going to. Right. I know. Those, those are the things to think about just as the devil's advocate, right? Uh, not that you have to have an answer for every scenario, 
but and that's why I kind of said unknown cloud storage, meaning that it's not something that's categorized by one filter that you could be whitelisting or blacklisting, unless you're potentially blacklisting uncategorized. How many people blo are, are uh, block uncategorized network activity by their, their whatever they, they have firewall? We do. Yeah. yeah. If it's not categorized, we don't let it out. Do you get a lot of categorization requests? Uh, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but they're required to go. With the process we have, they're required to get vice pre their vice president or their manager sign off before it hits security. That's beautiful. So we don't have to worry about what. Well, yeah. So you know, it's we don't get the dumb ones, ones. Yeah. and then have to bump it up to the VP. Right. It goes the other way. Around. Yeah. See, we were a local government. We do a lot of small businesses. Right, very small businesses, uh, legitimately so. Uh, if we went down to the local barber uh, that goes to the jails and cuts people's hair, mm -hmm. uh, they have a website that's somewhere and they need to get to it for vendor information and all kinds of stuff. It's very interesting to see how much things aren't categorized because it's not a large, on the top, you know, one million list or something like that that's uh, traversed. But uh, there's a way that we've tried to automate categorization. Um, right, so the help desk can go through and categorize something, whitelist it first, then categorize it later after analysis, things like that mm -hmm. uh, that you can look at doing. Um, uh, so, um, in this type of investigation, how many people would you only deal with your security team, or would you have to deal with like two or three different IT teams? Right. Maybe escalate to a manager, obviously, supervisor, maybe even higher. We actually, this is been probably the best thing that we've done. We have we have a person that sits on the infrastructure team that is an FTE out of the security budget, and mm -hmm. all they do is security requests. Mm -hmm. So anything we need to do that we don't have mm -hmm. access to for um, mm -hmm. separation of duties, mm -hmm. that FTE is capable of doing. So they're a point mm -hmm. person for anything infrastructure Perfect. related. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I'm old. We've we've done something similar where we've actually give a stands training to somebody just to note that person as the security hat. Um, mm -hmm. They get training and stuff like that, so they kind of see it as our advocate, um, things like that, which is kind of somewhat similar. But the thing is, at the end of the day, is that if you have a cert team or you have your incident response plan, is there someone that was involved in this that wasn't in the cert team that should have been? or maybe should not have been, right? And and when should have they have been. So you can kind of refine some of your policies. Again, because your or orchestration and your automation is going to work off of your policies and procedures. You don't want to start automating and orchestrating things that don't have any documentation or policies around, right? Um, because that's just going to get wacky. Um, and they're going to be like, why are they in this workflow? Right? There's no actual. So again, it's only going to be back to the foundational things. You're, you're Automation orchestration only be as good as your policies, your procedures, uh, your, your your data integrity of your um, assets, as well as any type of other enrichment data that you have available. So again, uh, we're going to go through here and uh, go through the measurement and improvement ROI. So how many people in their environment measure ROI specifically in the amount of the analyst time spent on something, even if it's something focused, right? So here's some just quick interesting math around, um, uh, again, number of phishing uh, emails per day is 40, right? That's not a large amount to get reported, right? I'm even assuming a 0.5% on an 8,000 person organization. To say 40 is a, a um, relative number there. Um, I, I, I did manual review would be one hour, but we, as we discussed earlier, it could be 30 minutes. So you can cut all, all my statistics in half. It's still a significant amount of money. Um, again, average hour related an analyst, I think the average on like last door is like $39. If I just put 35, right? I'm, I'm government. So um, it's probably less than that. But, you know, whatever that is for you guys, you have that statistics and you just to get, right, you know, at least what you make yourself, at least. So you can use that or go higher or lower based off of whoever's job it is to look at these things. As we said, most people don't have more than five people, so it's usually you guys in the room anyway. So you go through the overall cost estimation. It's very interesting. There's only phishing email. Um, and it's very simple math. Um, that's over $1,400 a day to handle those phishing emails. That's assuming you have five SOC analysts to handle 40. 
right? Or, or say it's two and a half because um, you can do it in, in, uh, in half the time in, in 30 minutes, right? And then, so say you don't even have that amount of people, what type of risk are you absorbing, right? Um, what type of, like, if you had uh, only two SOC op, uh, analysts, you might go down to 60% of the emails are being backlogged every day, right? Or 30% if you're, you know, doing it in 30 minutes, right? And what amount of risk is that is actually pertaining to your environment based off of, of some type of, of industry report statistics that you could use and back up in an executive uh, meeting? Well, they... 20% of, of users generally respond or click on phishing emails, right? That's going to change based on your security awareness, your type of user, your industry, all that stuff, right? But, but you know, basic survey and research kind of shows that, give or take. Uh, so that, then you could kind of, that, that's like 12% of those emails that are being backlogged could be compromised with your network, right? So where does security orchestration um, or automation work for you? to make sure that that one hour goes down to sub five minutes, right? Sub five minutes in this analysis, that would be, uh, you know, you could have that amount of staff savings and do everything under three and a half hours of triage time, or even less than that if, you, if you're doing 30 minutes, right, half that time. Did anyone ever really look at that? I mean, it's not mind-blowing math there, but it paints a picture that executives and fiscal um, officers kind of might understand more than, hey, I get all these phishing emails, and I don't have enough staffing, and we do all these things, and, you know, if you just say, like, it takes me 30 minutes to do this X task, we get this amount of tasks in place, this is how much it costs you to staff these people, and this is how much it's costing you a year. And if I invest and I buy this $150,000 orchestration system, or spend this on another staff person to do build this system, I could cut down, you know, 360 or, you know, um, $140,000 or $130,000 of staff, um, right? Does that make sense, or, or does that seem pretty easy? Did you guys do something like that? Same strategy we use to sell MSP services. Well, look at that. Just look at that. <laughs> Using math. <laughs> Anyone else? So, I mean, really, like, I mean, uh, either your your CISOs or CIOs. I mean, do you talk with them about this stuff? Or your managers, or, or maybe you're the person. Uh, Previously, I had to show how public to purchase something that was a major purchase, how it was going to affect the uh, budget and for the company. I would have to produce something like this, what was our return on the investment, which was our, what, where was our break even, and, and how would we um, uh, grow after that. Does that make sense to another? Uh, the, the high, I mean, how did you guys get the high of it? Just, just kind of got it in, it's open source, so you can kind of free, you can put it in there, you can test it, you can build it out, or I mean, or did you guys kind of go through an ROI? Obviously, you knew you needed right something, right? So, was there any general? Uh, just interesting. I mean, it was. A, I it, it has a, to be, but it was a finding actually from a from a table play. Okay. Um, and Look at that. It's like I'm. No, it was. <laughs> and so, uh, time was spent evaluating. Uh, the hive is not the only kind of security mm -hmm. incident response and tracking, mm -hmm. uh, even in the open source realm. And yep. we went through all of them. We reviewed them. And we chose the hive based on its functionality and its analyzers and all of those things. But um, you know, obviously there was uh, there there is. It's not that there's no cost to put up server. You have to back it up. You have to yep. do all those types of things. VMware licensing and all of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was inexpensive enough that, that it didn't require a lot of cost justification. But um, justification around a lot of other products are obviously return on investment. Uh, but some of them are not just are, are, don't always come down to a dollar per per you know per email kind of analysis. A lot of right, them come exactly. Down to also, yeah. you know, how much risk reduction do I get with this money? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that that also yep. factors into that. Mm -hmm. Me, the risk analysis was the biggest weapon I had. If uh, we did a risk assessment. And we had a known high risk issue that um, you know, our mm. board directors decided, oh, we're just going to accept the risk. And then the um, auditor or the federal auditor came in and asked why. They had to explain that. And they didn't want to sit through that uh, meeting. Mm. So generally, you could show the, uh, the amount of risk that uh, you could deter with the as well. Uh, the cost wasn't as much the issue. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on that? You guys 
looking at that stuff. Hopefully, hopefully you're looking at that in general, maybe not between the specifics with something. But another thing to take into consideration, when you look at like your average of fishing per day, sporty, this, this, that, kids of this, but then what happens is something like this happens, right? Um, so all of a sudden you have, um, you know, that's your, that's your normal data there, um, uh, your normalized data, and all of a sudden you start getting a phishing campaign against you, um, right? And yeah, luckily the blocks are, 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 you know, going up along with the, the total, uh, total and the quarantines are going up, but you know, what's getting through, right? Um, who's uh, it getting through to? And who's it getting through to, right? Um, again, once you start getting saturated with logs like this and an attack, um, how are you analyzing that you know things that are, aren't getting through? Obviously, your blinky boxes and things like that are doing a lot of the, the front work in that, but you know that there's probably percentages, very low percentages <laughs> getting through, and unfortunately, as you all know, it only takes one time. Right. So how are you orchestrating to make sure that you're covering all your bases when all of a sudden your intake of potentially even just one event being emails, uh, spam emails, uh, increased by 200, 300%. Right. You don't have all of a sudden 200, 300% people working for you, right? Um, can't call them the cavalry uh, or anything like that. So um, that's... Uh, that's something just to think about, right? And something also, uh, there's an additional ROI calculations you can do for that to normalize and all kinds of like uh, more into uh, statistics and stuff like that to make sure that you're covering all of those. But it's definitely something uh, to review and, and go to upper management. It's pretty simple and it talks, um, it talks to that usually. So that makes sense to everybody. Um, okay, I got a quick example, time permitting, because I wasn't sure of the time on this. I know we're going to have people are, are walking out here because we're kind of reaching the, uh, they have me going to six. I don't think I'm going to go to six. Um, so I'm going to go through these uh, examples pretty quickly. They're not large examples um, at all. They're just two slides of the two, oh, two examples um, here. And we already kind of talked about them, right? Um, so when you're looking at your sphere operations, the host firewall analysis, again, are you looking at your, how many people are actually looking at all the ports internally that are being used? I'm talking about workstations, right? Um, when you start going and getting that data, even if you were getting that data, what are you going to do with that data? There's no way, unless you're going through like a, a already an instance that is, is analyzing that for you to put context around that to be able to make sense of that data. Uh, here, this is an example of uh, a large amount of traffic uh, that is being permitted, and it's a large port there. Uh, I believe that is uh, port, um, I think like 1947 or something, so large that. Um, who, who do you think that port, that, that port ended up being? It was, it was huge. Hmm? Mm-hmm. We didn't even allow port, only port 80 out anyway. Well, unless it's just been a firewall pool for it, but I mean, this isn't a server, so this is just a workstation. So again, this is more lateral movement going on. What's the most evil things in the IT realm? No? File <laughs> shares? First person shooter? First person shooter? Printers. Printer, right? Um, those are rogue printers, right? Uh, people who use their own printers up, they map them directly. Would anything stop someone from putting a, a printer and, and, and mapping it uh, directly? I mean, you guys are you guys doing port security on every every Ethernet jack? Port security on every Ethernet jack? With MAC address whitelisting? Uh, the main That's log. how it works. Huh? The main log. Oh, okay, domain log. What happens if it's a non-domain join machine, like a, say like an IoT or something? It gets mapped. It gets mapped. Is that to a product or just a device? Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> huh? Okay. Ice? Yeah. Is that yeah. ice? Money, man. Yeah. You guys got big money. We got Thronus, we got giant Splunk instances, we got a Cisco Ice around here, Palo Altos. You guys have any dark trays in here? We're in the POC process with it. <laughs> I've, I've heard some 
No offense to Dark Crisis, great product you can get for it. Huh? I've heard some interesting things about about uh, Dark Crisis. Mm -hmm. I'm not involved in any of that. <laughs> so, anyways, th those are things to look at when you're doing port analysis, right? Is is there a what are the top ports? Um, even if it's not tar ports across it, what top ports per machine? that are over, say, like 30%, right? Those are the things you have to look at when, again, it's almost getting into like somewhat correlation in your logging and infrastructure and your SIM, but again, it's not something that's gonna replace your SIM, you're just making sense that it's more data analysis, right? And then off of that, you can make your orchestration um, or, or, or some type of automation. Um, here's another thing uh, here, this is, uh, you know, we. Apparently, we're blocking IPv6 until we start looking at uh, uh, a giant amount of IPv6 traffic um, internally, and that's interesting. What was it? Again, a printer, right? Uh, do you disable printers, and if people bring them in, do they just connect them and all of a sudden IPv6 them around, right? Um, so, very interesting stuff. Uh, how do you guys do MAC address uh, filtering? For IPv6, with a separate adapter, is it the same same way, or have you tested it? We haven't tested. We don't use that. Yeah. So the the thing is, is that it's most likely MAC address, MAC address, but uh, those are the things you might want to test to just make sure. You know, especially uh, I'm sure Cisco is doing all that kind of stuff, but sometimes you know, again, IPv6 is an interesting animal. So just be cautious of that. Those are two things. Um, again. Uh, um, I always leave with this, uh, I, get, I get a lot of people uh, from uh, either when I'm in my private sector or in uh, the public sector role saying like, you know what, this is all cool stuff, but it's not happening to us. How many people have heard of that? Well, it's not happening to us. We don't know what's happening to us, right? Um, one thing I just, I just recommend, it has nothing to do with security or uh, uh, automation or anything like that is find all of the businesses in the area that are high level or low level or in your industry sector in like your general vicinity, if that's the statewide, citywide, or maybe tri-state area or something relatively close to home uh, that people will know if you're a financial services industry or if you're an education industry, and then just make a slide like this. This is what I got, <laughs> uh, right? Um, so we got uh, websites uh, hacked with ISIS messages. We have ransomware shutting down public sector, we have anonymous attacking uh, cities and taking them down, we got uh, employees hit with scams of W-2s, uh, this is all just in our area, right? Uh, make it make it something flash like that, that's all. Um, but at the end, um, I'm going to just want to, again, take it away, is conduct the tabletop exercises. Uh, the full day tabletop exercises are great, but they take a lot of people, it's hard to schedule, hard to get all those people. We do something like one of those 15 minute ones discussion points, maybe a little more in depth. Uh, I'll include a bunch of tabletop exercises just in uh, some of my notes, things like that that you can use. There's also good things to follow on Twitter uh, that have instant response, tabletop exercises and scenarios that are like tweeted out. I don't know if they're daily, but they might be weekly um, or in some type of uh, frequent amount. Um, again, review your inventory system, but also how you access it, how quickly you can find something in there. Um, and, and see if you can just get dumps of that inventory system and put it somewhere that can enrich some of your data. It might be very easy to do today, um, right? Um, and then again, uh, just start setting up bi-weekly lunch meetings to discuss automation, place things that you can do, scripts that you can get working, um, how are you managing those scripts. Uh, we were kind of talking about scripts earlier, and the, the thing that to be very cautious of when you're doing automation, especially stuff with the Hive and other things like that, is that when you start running out and doing all these automated tasks and blocking things at the firewall level, make sure your scripts aren't also going to be your um, the end of the end of your days as well, uh, because those things are hijackable easily. And, and the the worst thing security people and the best thing security people can do is develop things, and um, it's the kind of a double-edged sword. Um, and uh, uh, be very careful with that. Look at power, look at signing your code, PowerShell sign. If you guys have a, some kind of PKI or, or certificate store, look at signing it and look at code version controlling that stuff. Even if you're not, I mean, you guys aren't developing full applications, but you're developing scripts that change over time, uh, look at version controlling. There are open source utilities out there. Uh, one that we use is Grog's, uh, G-O-G-S. 
uh, you can push up internally. It puts like a GUI on top of an uh, uh, internal Git repository. Um, it's very manageable and easy. I'll include it in notes um, to use and have almost like engineering and infrastructure or share PowerShell code. We have found it being very useful because we had to disconnect with our engineering team for just PowerShell code for you know AD stuff and 365 stuff and we started collaborating and sharing a lot on there. Also putting documentation with the code. There are probably code comments, there's probably like a little you know, in front of your DB script or whatever you got, you might have like a whole little comment section of what it does, but do you really have documentation around it? Why is it built? What's it doing? Um, we, we've been using our, our, when you look at Windows event collection, Windows event forwarding, and you're building that out and you're turning on and off subscriptions and events, uh, we've been using that repository as a, a more than like a, well, a full documentation around Windows event forwarding. We've been using that instead. Um, it's, been, it's been pretty helpful. Um, and every time the code gets updated, we have to push it up there, and then the engineering team actually copies the code from there and puts it into the, the uh, production. Um, so it's kind of like just a very simple process you can put in place. Again, once you start talking through those things, just buy lunch, you buy weekly lunch meetings, monthly lunch meetings about it, maybe lunch and learns and stuff like that. And as I discussed earlier, it's, uh, um, you know, load up the Hive um, training VM, play with it. Uh, there are other ones, I don't know, and, and when you're talking about looking at the Hive and other things, we, there's also other things like Fur out there. It's called Fast Instant Response. Um, it's also another operation management. I don't know if it does. It doesn't do the Cortex stuff, um, but uh, that was something that we looked at first. It was through a SANS, I think a SANS or, or, or French government or something kind of like backed it. So we were looking at other uh, U.S. CERT teams. We were looking at other CERT teams in general, like nation CERT teams, country cert teams and just see what they use to, to manage all their cases and incidences. Um, so I recommend doing as much research as possible with that. And again, also, just talk about when it's the right time to bring in automation. If you don't have the things, you don't have to automate things. Uh, but again, if you build the processes, then maybe you can eventually automate it, right? Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of all I have. Uh, I'll leave you guys with that. It's about 30 minutes early. I'll take additional questions um, and leave you with a uh, um, kind of a quote that I, I find fun is if you go from 30 36% on fire to 27% on fire, you're, you're still, still on fire. <laughs> right? So. I had it on my slide Huh? I had it on my slide Did you? Did I take it from you? Maybe. Uh, I think I took it from somebody else, so. Um, <laughs> so. Um, I took the question party from you. Oh, yeah. Any questions? Nothing. Was that was that better? I know it wasn't a hands-on workshop, um, uh, so I do apologize for that. But you can blame uh, Benny and the organizers for not having a hive and gray log environment to play with. <laughs> uh, but I got through that, um, and I hope it was somewhat interactive and discussion-based. Uh, I'll be here at the con. If you want to talk to me more about either the hive or, or specifics on. Uh, automation orchestration, um, let me know. Other than that, I hope it was somewhat useful. You learned something, take away something. At the end of the day, take away one thing, what can it be? Fishing the button. Fishing button. Fishing <laughs> button. All right, good. Just step one of automation. Fire. And fire. Lots of fire. There we go. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Why did you say MSP? I just got MSP, sorry. Oh, you mean manual? I just bought a full MSP. What about the full longer collection? Yeah. I'm just curious. They're not just selling this one, but it's all the time. Yeah, yeah. By the way, between 350 and. Because of the You No, no, 350 and 410. We took a break. Oh, I'll let it roll. You'll let it roll? Yeah, let it roll. Okay.